interrupted during the broadcast of tonight's meeting, the meeting will be stopped and we will take a short recess until we can continue. If for some reason we cannot continue, we will notify you as soon as possible when a new meeting can be scheduled. The board attorney has asked that I read the following statement. The Maryland Open Meetings Act, a state law, requires public meetings to be open to the public and to be, quote, held in places reasonably accessible to individuals who would like to attend these meetings. The virtual format of this meeting of the Board of Education is due to the COVID-19 emergency and is necessary in light of the serious health risks associated with public gatherings, as well as the various governors and county executive orders limiting public gatherings. While a virtual meeting of this type was not envisioned by the Open Meetings Act, steps have been taken to ensure that this virtual meeting includes alternative accessibility features that the Open Meetings Act Compliance Board and the courts have reviewed and approve broadcasting the meeting with video and audio and on cable TV and on the web and allowing written public comments to agenda items to be filed with the board office and considered by the board. The board attorney has opined that the public access provided by this technology makes this virtual meeting reasonably accessible to the public and provides appropriate opportunity to observe the conduct of the board's public business consistent with prevailing best practices during this emergency situation and therefore complies with the Open Meetings Act. Please pause for the invocation, followed by the Pledge of Allegiance. O oh God, we pray to administer that which is just in all educational policies. Being ever mindful of your guidance, stir us to action with love, wisdom, and understanding. And now for the Pledge of Allegiance. I pledge allegiance to the flag of the United States of America, and to the republic for which it stands, 
one nation under God, indivisible, with liberty and justice for all. Given that we are virtual, we're going to start off with a roll call. Mr. Gelland. Here. Ms. Hummer. Here. Here. Mr. Smith. Here. Ms. Ellis. Present. Mr. Grannon. Ms. Schalheim. Here. Ms. Antwine. Here. Mr. Lodd. Here. Thank you. Item 2.03, approval of the minutes. So moved. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and second. Do I have unanimous consent? Any dissent? Hearing no dissent from the floor, the meeting minutes are adopted as published. Item 2.04 is establish agenda order. Ms. Ellis, please. Um, you are muted. <laughs> My apologies. I move that the board add to its agenda this evening the following item. Item 6.03, negotiated agreement between the Board of Education and the Teachers Association of Anne Arundel County. I have a motion. Do I have a second? Second. Motion and second. Ms. Howell, please call roll. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Grannon? Aye. Ms. Schalheim? I'm sorry, can you repeat Ms. Schalheim? Aye. Ms. Antoine? Aye. Mr. Lyde? Aye. Ms. Corkado? Aye. Motion passes 9-0. Thank you, Ms. Howell. Uh, item 2.05 is recognitions. I do not believe we have any this evening. Item 2.06 is the policy committee update. And before we begin, I just wanna take a couple words, um, a presidential privilege to thank Mr. Lyde. Mr. Lyde um, joined us the same time I, I joined the board. And I know we're going to be doing recognitions. Um, and so this is in particular with him as policy chair. And I just wanna mention that his leadership is exactly what I envisioned for our policy committee. And he is so well served and led us um, through some trying times. All of our core committees, particularly the policy committee, which has to be operating at all times, had to do the fast shuffle that the board did and he rose to the occasion. Recently, um, uh, I had the, uh, I was flipping through um, social media and a friend of mine had posted a quote and I read the quote, didn't know who actually said it. Um, and I thought of Mr. Lott. And this is, one of the things when I thought of him, I said, you know, this is one of the lessons I've learned. He has been a great mentor to every single member. And I don't think that I could better express what I felt when I read this quote. So um, pardon me, but I'm not, I'm going to quote somebody else here unapologetically. And this is from Fulton J. Sheen, who is an American theologist and uh, and came up with quite a few altruisms in his day. And it says, patience is not an absence of action. Rather it is, quote, timing. It waits on the right time to act for the right principles and in the right way. And Bob has demonstrated that and brought new meaning to the word team 
in a very trying transition. Bob, I cannot thank you enough for your leadership um, as our policy chair, and I am definitely going to miss you. So on that note, um, I'm going to ask you to please um, make your final policy committee report, and thank you so much for your service. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, but you know, the team does do the work. And that's what it's all about. Anyway, today was our uh, meeting of the policy committee. We met at 2.30 and uh, we discussed the possible revisions to policy Juliet Alpha Alpha, J-A-A, redistricting and attendance areas. Uh, we included a review of, pre of uh, previous policy committee discussions comments and observations of committee members, as well as recommendations we received from the CAC, uh, from board council, and other members of the board. At our next meeting, we will review and discuss a draft policy incorporating many of the comments and recommendations from today's detailed discussions. As was the case at our recently updated CAC policy. The committee is committed to not rush this effort, believing that taking our time and ensuring our efforts are truly collaborative is the key to developing a solid policy recommendation going forward. And I'm confident that the policy committee will accomplish that. So uh, thank you very much for the time and thank you for your comments, Madam President. That's my report. Thank you, Mr. Live. Greatly appreciated. Next is our budget committee report. Ms. Ellis, please. Thank you. Uh, today, the budget committee met at 4.45. Um, we asked for any updates on any additional CARES or other types of COVID relief funding. Um, since our last report, uh, there have been no additional funds However, it was discussed that um, the funding that, that was um, distributed by the federal government to the state and through the state to the county um, does expire on December 30th. So we were hopeful. Um, we have, uh, our leadership has been in um, constant communication with uh, the county and the state. Um, so hopefully um, as, they're deciding what to do with the remaining funding. We'll um, may, maybe get some additional relief there. Um, it was also discussed that um, the state has been looking at the numbers as far as uh, revenues um, that in May were considered, were feared to be um, much lower than now current projections, but we don't, we don't have any uh, specifics on that yet. Um, there will be a meeting on December 15th to get an, an additional update on that. So I hope we will have some more specifics. Um, we're just hoping that the budget um, for, uh, for our next fiscal year will not be too deeply impacted, but it is certainly unrealistic to expect that there won't be significant impacts on, on funding, um, particularly because our student enrollment um, for this year, which is a number that is uh, used to uh, determine much, much of the state and county funding, our student enrollment is down at about one and a half to 2%. Um, so I, I know that various agencies um, may um, our school system, um, this board um, have been reaching out asking for our legislate, legislators to look at um, some sort of hold harmless provision that will not deeply impact our, um, our budget for next year should those students return, which I think is um, largely to be expected. So um, I'm afraid it wasn't the, um, the happiest of occasions this evening as we um, discuss all the, um, all the impacts on our budget uh, because we obviously want to offer our students um, all the services they need for a top-notch education.
Thank you very much, Ms. Ellis, greatly appreciated. Next item is 2.08, the CRASC report. And joining us tonight is Ms. Beckett Hummer, the CRASC Secretary of Education. Ms. Hummer. Good the evening, Hummer. President. Oh, sorry. Good evening, President Corkadel, Vice President Ellis, members of the board, and Dr. Arlotto. Hello, my name is Beckett Hummer, and I'm, the so I'm a sophomore at Mead High School and the CRASC Secretary of Education. I am very excited to announce that CR the CRASC elected officers have selected the remaining 17 positions of the CRASC executive team. We have a record number of applicants this year, and the talent and leadership skills were evident in all of the applications. Congratulations to the appointed members. We are so excited to get to work. With our executive board for the year being set, students are taking leadership positions across the county to represent the student voice. CRASS recently sent stu two students, Mara Bob and myself, Beckett Hummer, to participate on the calendar committee, voicing student concerns for the 2021-2022 school year. Camille Carter, the CRASS e equity officer, will be the student member of the County Executive's Human Relations Committee, and Katie Lewis, wellness officer, will be a member of AACPS's Wellness Council. Last week, student representatives from each high school and specialty program joined Dr. Arlotto for the second superintendent's teen advisory meeting. Students had a great conversation overall, asking many insightful questions to Dr. Arlotto. Arlotto. Items on the agenda included the wellness, questions on wellness blocks, lengths of class periods, and overall school engagement. The next meeting is Tuesday, December 8th. On November 11th, the Let's Talk Justice team was excited to host 38 students for the second general meeting, connecting with students from across the county to have a discussion on women's rights. Let's Talk Justice will continue to host monthly general meetings on the second Wednesday of each month at 1.15 p.m. Please join the Google Classroom or visit the website for more information. The Coping with Anxiety Youth in 2020 Forum is now live. Five members from the Let's Talk Justice, from Let's Talk Justice including Mr. Smith, recently recorded a discussion with professionals from Anne Arundel County Health Department Anne Arundel County Mental Health Agency and AACPS about this critical issue. The discussion premiered last week on AACPS TV, but will rebroadcast Wednesday, November 25th at 6 p.m. It is also available to watch on the AACPS YouTube channel. A special thank you goes out to the AACPS video production team and the communications office. We could not have done this without you. Additionally, the service learning leadership team hosted a general meeting for students interested in service learning, the service learning portal, or getting involved. There was a general meeting earlier today on the fall service project. If you are interested in participating, please contact Lori Fowler at ldfowler at acps.org. It was recently announced that the Maryland General Assembly PAGE program had been re redesigned for the 2021 session. The reimagined virtual PAGE program will be totally virtual and offered on a Zoom platform. Applications, resumes, and essays were due by Sunday, November 8th, and interviews for applicants occurred last week. Thank you to AACPS Legislative and Policy Council, Ms. Jeanette Ortiz, and Social Studies Coordinator, Ms. Eve Case, for joining CRASC President Connor Curran and myself on the interview panel. The selected pages will be notified in early December. We are so proud of the amazing student leaders who will represent our county during the 2021 session. On Saturday, November 14th, MASC MASC hosted a virtual fall leadership conference focusing on mental health. Justin Paleska from Mead High School, along with Arusa Malik and Caroline Finn from South River High School, were workshop leaders at this year's event. Kraft sent 25 students to FLC this year, and they had an amazing experience connecting and learning with other students from across the state. Finally, Kraft is currently working on constitution creating bylaws, creating procedures for virtual elections, defining and establishing ethics rules, and restructuring our, ethics, our executive board are priorities for this year's revisions. Our hope is that after this year's revisions, we will not need to revise our constitution for as long as possible. Our constitution revision committee is led by CRASC parliamentarian and is composed of CRASC executive board members, as well as other students from across the county to gain different perspectives. As you can tell, the CRAS team has been very busy since our last report. Additionally, although this is not their last meeting, CRAS would like to give a big shout out to several board members in which this is their last meeting that CRAS will give a report at. Mr. Gilliland, Mr. Granan, Ms. Hummer, and Mr. Live, thank you so much for your tireless work and support of the students in this county. You will be greatly missed. 
Crash wishes you the best in your future endeavors. Thank you. Thank you very much, Ms. Hummer. And please extend our congratulations to all of your appointees and um, those who are working hard um, to support and well represent our students and our AACPS community. Thank you very much. Item 2.09 is the PTA report. And joining us this evening is Mallory Lafron, president of Anne Arundel County Council of PTAs. Um, Ms. Lafon, um, before we begin, I just want to remind everyone, I, I noticed a couple people do not have their mics um, muted, so please do so at this time if you have not already, so that uh, there has been some background noise. Thank you very much. Ms. Lafon, you have the floor. Thank you. Good evening, President Corkadel, uh, Dr. Arlotto, board member, and um, board members. For the record, my name is Mallory Lafon, interim president of the Anne Arundel County Council of PTAs. Um, during our November meeting, we appointed a new interim secretary, Samantha Weaver from Nantucket Elementary. We look forward to working with her on the board. Other board positions are still available, including committee chairs, vice president, and treasurer. Earlier this month, AACC PTA held a president and treasurer training for new and existing officers. If any local PTAs or PTSAs need additional training, please email us at info at AACCPTA.org. In lieu of a meeting, we will be hosting an implicit bias training led by National PTA board member Penny Christian. The workshop will be held virtually on December 14th. Information on registration will be forthcoming. Um, AACC PTA is looking to connect PIAC and PTA by hosting virtual meet and greets mm -hmm. with cluster um, PIAC representatives and PTA boards. We have recently started highlighting local PTAs on our um, Facebook page. Congrats to Odington Elementary PTA and Monarch Academy Annapolis PTA for being featured for their creativity and continued advocacy for our students. Um, the Maryland PTA Advocacy Committee is currently working to pinpoint priorities for the upcoming legislative sessions. Current issues on the table include current overrides, blueprint, well, excuse me, blueprint coalition and related bills, land use, funding, broadband accessibility, free menstrual products in schools, built to learn, safe routes, and emergency COVID bills. Um, I just want to take a moment to reiterate our statement on the reopening of schools. Like most of our families and teachers, we want to get back in the classroom when it is safe with clear and consistent communication with appropriate timing to make the best possible decisions for our families, making sure the plan is safe and equitable for all while following metrics as recommended by Anne Arundel County Health Department. And lastly, on a personal note, I want to say warm regards and best wishes to board member Julie Hammer. As a previous PTA president, and as a, a fierce champion for students in equity, I'm certainly gonna miss your presence on the board. In the words of the late Ruth Bader Ginsburg, real change, enduring change happens one step at a time. And I can't wait to see what your next steps are in advocating for students and serving your community. Thank you. President Cork, are you muted? You're still muted, President Rubio. That's two for one. <laughs> Sorry about that. Um, uh, thank you very much, um, Ms. Lafon. Item 2.10 is the CAC report. And joining us tonight is Ms. Tanisha Howard, who is um, the chair of the CAC. Ms. Howard. Thank you. Good evening, President Corkadell, Vice President Ellis, fellow board members, and Dr. Olato. My name is Tanisha Howard, Chair of the CAC. And on behalf of the CAC body, I am pleased to update the board on our activities. The Citizens Advisory Committee of Anne Arundel County Public Schools Board of Education is an executive committee made up of 13 clusters together with the at-large military AA. CCPTA, CCAC, and PIAC representatives to make a 32-member panel. The CAC delivers input and advice on specific issues surrounding education throughout the county. The CAC executive leadership team is led by a chair, vice chair, secretary, 
and our staff liaison with the Office of School and Family Partnerships. Under normal circumstances, our meetings are held at 2644 Reva Road, Annapolis, Maryland, on the second Monday of each month from 6.45 to 8.45 p.m. Our schedule is posted on the AACPS uh, webpage underneath the board tab. Our next regularly scheduled meeting is Monday, December 14th. Given social distancing mandates and closure of AACPS facilities, the CAC will conduct our meetings virtually and will continue to ensure we provide ample time for notification and posting to our website, allowing for community participation. The CAC held its last meeting of the 2020-2021 school year virtually on Monday, November 9th. We are pleased to report our subcommittee redistricting and attendance areas has completed their work and submission was made to the board policy committee today. Our other subcommittees and special advisory teams student and gender identity, emergency plans, pandemic response, hate and bias, CAC resources exploration and cross county CAC collaboration will continue to uh, meet. And over the course of the next coming months, we will activate additional committees to meet the requirements placed upon our body. <coughs> Excuse me. The CAC received board motion of November 4th by President Corcodell to specifically, quote, review the reopening plans using whole plan SWOT analysis methodology with an emphasis on special education services and equity in all aspects of current and proposed reopening plans with the time frame for delivery occurring in the upcoming months. The CAC recognizing recognizes this unique opportunity to provide invaluable independent analysis for the board consideration on truly significant and urgent future actions. Accordingly, accommodations were, were immediately made to ensure updates to the meeting agenda and advanced dissemination of relevant background information to our members for preparation. We have the preliminary reports from each of our five groups convened with a specific lens, emergency plans, equity, wellness, overall hybrid and overall virtual, which will be consolidated into one comprehensive report for submission delivery to the board. We understand the board has and will continue to address this urgent matter and ensure communication is thorough in addressing reopening. CAC leadership wanted to take this opportunity to publicly acknowledge our members who participated in the SWOT analysis their professionalism, diligence, and willingness to participate to provide extremely vital and invaluable input on such a critical concern area for the board with limited time for engagement was wonderful and truly appreciated. Moreover, and most importantly, the teamwork this year has been truly exemplary given the extraordinary intersection of a global health pandemic, economic impacts, and cultural reckoning we continue to face. The Board of Education has expressed a high esteem for our group and its ability to coalesce collectively to meet this challenge and further deepen our partnership and collaboration with the board. The CAC will do our best to support these efforts and be of any resource to the board so that we can achieve our mandate with purpose, direction, and results. We look forward to the work still ahead knowing our group is poised for success. Finally, we want to extend our sincere farewell to all departing board members. It was truly a pleasure working with you over these past three years. Good luck to you in your future endeavors. Thank you very much. You're on mute, Madam President. My apologies. Um, I've got lots of names and stuff uh, coming up here in front of me, so my apologies for that. Um, next is item, oh, where is it? Okay. <laughs> Give me one second here, I lost my um, thing. So next is item 3.0 is the public comment on agenda items. And so, um, 
one of the things that um, we will we we're starting doing um, uh, effective this meeting is hearing public comment through our Zoom portal and um, the uh, pilot of this for the October 20th meeting was very successful. So we have several people that have signed up this evening and in that interest, um, I'm going to call the individual and they will be provided with um, two minutes opportunity. And so uh, they already received instructions. Um, thank you so very much for obliging them. And we are going to start, um, we were going to start with item 4.02, the school year calendar. My understanding is the one individual who did uh, sign up uh, for uh, virtual testimony is not yet logged in. I will see if they are available at the conclusion. Uh, we have a total of five individuals signed up for item 5.02, which is the reopening plan update. And so um, first is Chris uh, Butterball. Sir? Uh, Ms. Corkadel, he has not signed in. Okay. Um, next is Judith Keeler. Ms. Howe, is, um, has he signed in? Uh, I'm right here. Or, or, or she? Yeah. Okay, great. <laughs> Ms. Keeler. Uh, something different this time. Good evening. Okay. My name is Judith Keeler, and I have an 11th grader at Arundel High School. We are taking the necessary precautions as coronavirus cases have increased drastically in the past few weeks. However, if our community acts responsibly, they will eventually go down. And when they do in Anne Arundel County and we're within public health guidelines to reopen, parents should expect no less then all grade levels be given the opportunity to re return to the classroom at the same time. We have to be ready and must have a strategy in place for our secondary students. Too much time has been spent picking through the weeds of the elementary school hybrid mo model, all while the high school students are floundering around in a repetitive motion. Our students feel trapped in life right now. Last week, the AACPS high school group Let's Talk Justice presented another excellent student-led discussion on YouTube, this one titled Coping with Anxiety in conjunction with leading mental health professionals in the county. I encourage all of you to watch the discussion led by Mr. Smith, as Beckett Hummer had mentioned earlier. Our high school students are doing the best they can, but sitting at home alone, isolated from their peers and having half their classmates' cameras turned off, isn't cutting it for them, and it shouldn't be cutting it for us. We are not doing our best for them. My son told me this morning, I'm putting in my time so I can get it over with. As for the 14 reopening committees and their now future planning committees, they must have parents at all grade levels represented, as well as a mixture of clusters throughout the school district. If we are ever to be truly serious about meeting even the first value of our strategic plan, all meets all. Finally, I urge you to plan now for all grade levels to return second semester if the health metrics, metrics permit. 326, that's the number of days our students will have been out of their school buildings when second semester starts in February. Thank you for your time and for those leaving the board in December, Thank you so much for your service to the community, to the school district, students and families of Anne Arundel County. Thank you. President Corkett, are you muted? About that. Um, I, I think I'm double clicking. <laughs> um, next is Ms. Elizabeth Fine. And thank you very much, Ms. Keeler. Uh, hello, good
Good evening. My name is Elizabeth Fine, and I am the mother of two secondary students, a former public school teacher and military wife. Every day I hear another story about successful school reopenings across this country from former colleagues of mine. America is failing our students daily by not reopening when there's clear evidence that schools are not where this virus is spread. A professor of pediatrics at the Indiana University School of Medicine said it best yesterday in the New York Times. Schools are essential and schools should be treated as such. When we prioritize, they should be among the last things to close. Almost everything else should be put on pause first. So with that, I beg you to not put a ludicrous future date on our students' return like the Howard County Board did Monday night. During the last meeting, you voted against Ms. Hummer's motion to bring teachers back to the buildings January 4th. If you are not willing to set a date for teachers to return, then please don't set a date for students either, but only use metrics. Dr. Fauci said yesterday that 20 million people could have the vaccine by the end of December. So setting a future date without knowing metrics with an ever-changing virus and vaccine possibility is irrational. We failed our students by not beginning the year in person when our metrics were so low. So I implore you to now permit all students, not just elementary, to return when metrics permit. Our students- Welcome to Zoom. Enter your meeting ID, followed by the tab. Um, right. Miss Fine, Miss Fine, I'm going to grant you some additional time. Somebody had their mute uh, on, okay. and so you can finish. For your participant ID, followed by we failed our students by not beginning the year in person when our metrics were so low. So I implore you to now permit all students, not just elementary, to return when metrics permit. Our students will have been out of the classroom for almost 11 months at the start of the second semester. When this spike is over, we must give any student the opportunity who desires an in-person return to learning the chance to just have one. We lost the option for staggering grade level entrances when we simply talked and did not implement a plan, especially when there are already concrete plans in existence being implemented across this nation daily. We simply can't allow our secondary students to remain at home all year. Once the spike has passed, the crisis will no longer be physical, but instead be the serious and continued mental health decline of our secondary students. Again, please, no date, only using metrics, and any student simply afforded the chance to learn in person if they desire when this surge has passed. Thank you so much for all your hard work. Thank you, Ms. Fine. Next is Brian Sador. Sir? Good evening, can you hear me? Yes, sir, you may proceed. Thank you. Good evening and thank you for the opportunity to speak tonight and voice my opinion. Today we are at the eight month mark of our children being forced to learn in a virtual environment and therefore being denied the most effective education possible. Given our current path, we are most likely looking at our children being away from school for over a year. In addition to being socially detrimental, virtual learning is simply not as effective as in-person education, particularly for our K through fifth grade students. Despite the best efforts of our very capable teachers, most parents who are in a position to observe virtual learning and are being honest know that virtual learning is simply not as effective as in-person instruction. Increased distractions at home, lack of, the direct, lack of direct oversight that is present in the classroom, technical difficulties, and the lack of a structured learning environment in the home all act as impediments to effective learning in a virtual environment. I'm not sure that many parents, including myself, understand specifically why in-person instruction is not an option available to parents. In terms of the safety of our children, according to CDC data, more children under the age of 14 have passed away from the flu each season than have died from COVID over the last eight months. Schools have never shut down during flu season. Teachers, assuming most are under the age of 55, are also at minimum risk with an over 99% survival rate for those under that age that contract the virus. Those are real numbers from CDC. I understand some teachers or their immediate family members may be high risk, but there are, there are accommodations that can be made so that their health and safety is not jeopardized. 
Given these facts, what precedents are we setting for the future? What exactly is the threshold for shutting down schools for future flu outbreaks or less serious pandemics? Is this going to be the norm for the future? I also understand that some families may have circumstances in which members of the household are considered high risk, but many families do not. Therefore, one size fits all solution is not the best. Parents should be given the choice as to whether they want their children to return to in-person instruction or continue virtual learning, and they can base their decision on individual circumstances and what's best for their children and their families. Parents are in the best position to weigh the risk of returning their children to in-person instruction, considering their risk tolerance, against the benefits of such instruction and its increased effectiveness. Neither decision is the wrong one, but parents should be given the option. There are a variety of options to consider with a hybrid approach, whether it's live streaming instruction from the classroom. Your time has expired. It, you can summarize. Okay. Um, you may Just summarize. Two, two more sentences. The bottom line is that we owe our ch to our children and their future to provide them the most effective education possible and put them in a position to be successful in life. We as a community and you as a board have the responsibility to serve the best interests of, of our children and their education. Thank you. Thank you, sir. Um, we had a couple people that were not quite signed in. I want to give them uh, an opportunity to do so. Um, I had on reopening plan, um, Chanel Harrington. Has Chanel Harrington signed in? No, ma'am, she has not. Chris Harrington had signed up for two items, item 4.02 and 5.02. Regrettably, we are going to have to move along. And um, Chris Butterbell. He has not signed in. Thank you very much. This concludes the, uh, the virtual live, um, I'll call it a uh, testimony um, from our residents. Ms. Howe, would you please report on the um, items that uh, were submitted for written testimony uh, to the board um, that we have not heard from? Yes, so we received three additional comments, one of which was received within the time frame that was sent um, to you in advance, as well as posted to the website. The two other comments that were received were sent to you in advance of this meeting as well. Thank you very much, Ms. Howe, greatly appreciated. Um, next item, uh, we have some very uh, special guests. We have two presentations this evening under section four. And it is always an honor and a privilege uh, to have our Anne Arundel County Police Department joining us this evening. And so item 4.01 is the Anne Arundel County Police Department's fresh START program and a statistics update for the board. And I'm going to ask Ms. Tamika Perkins to uh, first thank you so very much for coming. And I will give you the opportunity to introduce your team um, and some familiar faces. Thank you so much once again for joining us. Thank you, President Corcado. Um, I'd like to introduce um, Corporal Michelle Levere. She's here beside me. She is a new addition um, to our unit since we last addressed the board. Um, also on the call is Major um, Katie Goodwin. Um, Regrettably, um, Chief Lowry could not be here this evening. Um, he is at a funeral for one of our officers, um, but he sends his regards. So if you guys can give me just a brief moment to share my screen. While we're doing that, Ms. Perkins, could you please extend our deepest condolences to our police community and to the families um, grieving? Yes, ma'am, thank you so much. Can everyone see my screen? All right. So just before um, the pandemic hit, um, myself and uh, Chief Altamari addressed the board um, discussing some of our diversion programs and some statistics um, that we had at the time. Um, we just wanted to provide you with an update because at the time we, we mentioned that we had some things in the works um, that we couldn't yet speak about. And so we just wanted to update you guys um, on that. For those of you um, who were not able to see that uh, presentation, 
um, the uh, Youth Services Division of the Anne Arundel County Police Department um, handles all juvenile offenses uh, within the county that would be school-based as well as um, patrol-based. But in addition to those, the, the charging side of it, we also are responsible for officer training. We work very, very closely with our crisis intervention team to make sure that all officers have um, up-to-date and relevant training on sh things like trauma, um, juvenile-specific issues, uh, issues related to victims of crime, and all of that. Um, additionally, we have the Handle with Care program, which is our partnership with the school system designed to make sure that uh, teachers and administrators are aware um, when any student has been exposed to trauma uh, prior to entering the classroom. I just wanted to give you all an update that that program has continued during virtual learning. Um, we still send notices um, to the principal prior to the start of every school day. Uh, principals do have a way that they, each school has their own individual way of responding to that. Uh, counselors involved, PPWs are involved. But it, because of the virtual setting, we have also gotten our crisis intervention team involved to ensure that the most vulnerable among us are still receiving services, even in a virtual setting. We will touch base with, um, on that aspect a little bit later, but I just wanted to let you all know that that is continuing even in the virtual setting. Uh, my unit is also responsible to linking youth as well as their families to any services that we may have available. Um, so that could be mental health, behavioral health, substance abuse, um, support groups, uh, anger management, coping skills, that kind of thing. So we want to make sure that it's not just necessarily a response to a crime, but we are very heavily involved in the prevention side of it as well. Uh, we have our three youth diversion programs, our community conferencing program, which is uh, very strongly rooted in restorative justice, um, similar to mediation where two individuals as well as their support systems will come together with the mediation um, uh, or excuse me, with a facilitator to handle, um, to resolve an issue outside of the criminal justice system. We have our teen court program, um, which of course is on hold because of COVID. Um, and we also have our joins program, which is a uh, similar um, to teen court and its consequences. We come from the principle of meaningful intervention rather than a punitive standpoint. And we'll touch base um, on that a little bit later on as well. We also are responsible for, for data tracking related to juvenile offenses. Um, we are, are striving as a department to, to let the data drive our program so that we can really um, use an equity lens and be very intentional about our programming. So just an um, review for those of, of you who were not able to see that presentation in March. Um, just an update. So I know uh, the board members really were excited when I got the opportunity to share some of our use work. So this is just some updated information. Um, I really, really like the Google slide um, that goes along with a full uh, campaign on mental health resources that are available during the age of COVID. So um, we met with this young person prior to COVID happening and they were going to do a mental health awareness campaign um, for us as one of their interventions, but COVID happened. And so they made it um, even more relevant uh, so that their, their peers could know what's available to them now that school is out of session. Um, as you can see, uh, we want the consequences to be individualized to meet both the root cause of the offense as well as the needs of the individual. So talking about impulse control, talking about anger management, where we can go for help for um, issues that we're dealing with, as well as working with that young person to come up with coping skills if this is a need-based offense. During calendar year 2019, we diverted 575 youth away from the juvenile justice system. Now that would be both school-based offenses and patrol offenses, but that is a significantly larger number than we've ever done before. Um, as, uh, as we mentioned in March, this is a program that is constantly growing and constantly evolving. Of note, it, as we intentionally take a look at our racial and ethnic disparities is the fact that, that the number of youth diverted were approximately 60% minority, which is huge because a lot of times the same racial and ethnic disparities that we see elsewhere throughout systems, um, we see in uh, the diversion study. So we can have diversion programs, but it doesn't necessarily mean that they are addressing racial and ethnic disparities. And I am very, very proud to say that for the third year in a row that we've been keeping this data, 
our, our, our diversion programs directly impact um, the racial and ethnic disparities. So as from a law enforcement standpoint, well over 80% of the youth that participate in our diversion programs do not have any additional contact. Um, that goes a long way um, just because the contact with law enforcement officers isn't always the most pleasant, but we're able to at least have them have some meaningful consequences so that we are not reoffending and we no longer have that contact that's adverse to their, uh, their lives. And so that is the approach that we are taking, non-punitive intervention that focuses on accountability. Um, so since we last spoke, our responsibilities have been expanded. Um, a couple words that you're gonna hear me say constantly throughout uh, this presentation, one of which is, is intentional. We really want, we're looking at a data-driven approach and we've taken the time that COVID um, ha has given us to take a step back and see how we can improve. Um, for starters, we have um, expanded the unit. So um, I, I remember when I addressed you guys in March, we talked about how um, it, it was just me. And so we have since expanded the unit to um, include Corporal LeVere, um, who's here to my right, as well as Lieutenant Michael Cox. Um, he did send his regards. He was an, he is on another um, Zoom call um, about another youth program because we're constantly expanding. Um, so you, you will have the opportunity to meet him as well. Uh, and the other words that you will continually hear me talking about is a fresh start. That is the goal for our unit is a fresh start. And start is actually an acronym that we have created that kind of um, will be the guiding light for, for all programs that you see coming from our unit from here on out. Um, of course, one thing that we're always going to, to talk about is safety. Um, safety is important within schools, within patrol. That is something that's very important is keeping everyone safe. Trauma-informed, we always want to be on the cusp of, you know, recognizing trauma within the youth, whether it is from a microscopic lens or a larger lens, what's going on with the individual or what's going on within the home. Um, we never want to be so focused on a particular issue that we forget the other aspects. So, so one thing I think that um, we mentioned uh, in March that I want to reiterate is when we have a diversion program, every single one of those uh, uh, students who go through that has an... Uh, an over hour meeting with the individual, the family, as well as a panel, because we want to get to the root of the issue. Um, we want to make sure that we can send them to appropriate services. And that's because we definitely as a department want to come from a trauma informed lens. Accountable. We want to make sure that these children understand that every consequence, there is some accountability that comes along with it, whether um, they see it as accountable in just taking place in it or recognizing that what they did can be fixed and the behavior can be fixed behind it, but just accountability in general, it has to be recognized. And the sooner they recognize that, the more we can be impactful in their lives. Um, of course, everything, you guys know how big of a fan I am of restorative justice. We want to expand the way that we allow these young people to restore their community, um, ex restore their school. Uh, that is something that you will see woven into all, all aspects of our program. And that part will actually be uh, expanded upon as well. And then the last piece is something that's very important um, to all of us here is transparency. That's why we thought it was so important for us to come in and share um, the, the statistics with you guys, sh show you guys how we have improved, but also what we uh, intend to do so that we can improve even more. So in addition to all of the efforts that we were previously doing in our expansion, we have added new strategies. Um, so the Minority Youth Advisory Council is one of our new initiatives. Um, we just recently extended the deadline uh, for the application. So any youth that you all have in mind, please get the word out. Uh, we extended the application deadline until uh, the second week of December. So the Minority Youth Advisory Council is essentially a program that gives youth the opportunity to interact with law enforcement officers um, and engage in some restorative practices. Um, it's going to include a restorative justice circle that gives the participants a chance to voice their feelings uh, with a facilitator that is going to specialize in police youth dialogue. It's not going to be one of the situations where um, the youth are there and it's just the, the beat up on law enforcement section. We don't want that. We want to be able to engage in a healthy environment so that everybody's feelings are addressed and understood. Um, it's also going to include a town hall piece where everybody is able to bring to the table things from their community, what they're seeing, 
where they need additional resources, where they need help. Um, and lastly, there's going to be an education piece. The education piece is so important because it allows the youth to get something out of the program, whether it is um, teaching them how to enact a social media campaign or getting um, information on mental health, trauma, and also some substance abuse uh, interventions. I think the, the, the very unique part about that Minority Youth Advisory Council is this is not going to be um, it's going to have action items. So that education piece, if the youth are interested um, in learning how to mount a social media campaign, they will be working alongside the officers um, who have been selected to participate to create action items um, so that they can collaborate and improve their community. Uh, the recommendations that they give will be sent up um, we will teach them how to do a how how to do a report um, that's with recommendations that is um, available for review by command staff. Um, so we really want to know what the youth says so that we can be more intentional in our programming, because what we may think um, the community needs, there may be a disconnect from what the community thinks they need. And so we really want that input so that we can continue to design our programs to best fit um, the needs of uh, students and families alike. Um, the next item that um, is getting ready to roll out is our pre-arrest diversion. So I'm a huge proponent of diversion, but what statistics tell us is that diversion alone is not enough. Um, the label that is attached to a, a charge or a citation, as well as the collateral consequences, um, as far as employment, military service that are associated with that citation are very, very real. So now that we have a handle um, on the on our diversion efforts, what we are looking to do as a department is push it back one step. What that means is um, there is a, for, for divertible offenses, so these are not serious offenses, um, your uh, a second degree assaults, your fights, your misdemeanor offenses, nonviolent offenses that would be eligible for, for pre-arrest diversion. Prior to the issuance of a citation, um, a officer um, or a civilian would reach out to the family for participation in a diversion program. So it would be similar to our other programs, 90 days, um, individualized consequences, link with linkages to service services, link with linkages to our crisis intervention team, any mental health substance abuse services that they need, as well as mentorship. Um, and that would be done in lieu of charges. We are getting ready to pilot that in one district um, to, to see what obstacles we face in that um, before rolling it out countywide. Um, it will be available to all, all officers in the near future, but that is the direction that we are heading to remove the stigma associated with that juvenile citations whenever we can, as well as implementing early intervention strategies to make sure that the youth have the the, the uh, resources that they need to be successful. Um, and we're very, very excited about that. And our officers are very excited about that as well. Um, and then the final thing is uh, continuous evaluation of our programs. You all know that I'm a data person and I always want um, our officers to be the most up-to-date and um, the, the best trained officers that they can be because I, I truly believe that that um, is what is going to make us successful as uh, collaboratively. So during the time of COVID, that's exactly what we've been doing is making sure that um, our officers are getting training. We believe that SROs are a very valuable part of the school community and we have um, sought to continue that impact during COVID. Many of our SROs have been temporarily assigned um, while school is out to assist with our crisis intervention team. That means that they are checking in on our most vulnerable students. They are following up with um, those students who may be struggling. And this is not um, anything enforcement related. This is purely, how are you doing? Is there anything that you need? Do you need any resources? Um, does your family need any resources? Do you have everything that you need to be successful? Somebody that you have built a relationship with cares about you or somebody that you didn't know before cares about you. You are not alone dur during this pandemic. Everyone um, it, it is here for you if you need them. And I'm extremely proud of, of that uh, aspect. Additionally, um, we have continued with our training. I went out uh, a couple months ago and trained all school resource officers. Um, we, folk, we did some refresher. Um, as you guys know, all school resource officers are required to have 40 hours of specialized statewide approved training. Um, and so in addition to that, 
Many of our um, SROs are also trained in crisis intervention as well as other uh, uh, mental health areas. But we went out and we specifically talked trauma. We talked about the trauma of COVID. We talked about the trauma of racism and the social justice issues and how that is going to affect the kids when we do go back to school, how that's gonna affect the relationship between officers and kids. And we talked uh, real, world, real world strategies as to how um, our officers can repair some of the relationship that's been impacted uh, by some of the, the recent events in the, across the nation. Then we also talked about the impact of uh, the environment that the kids are feel isolated in and the way that that's going to um, affect them and what they're going to bring back into the classroom with them. We wanted to make sure that our officers knew that so that they could be prepared um, with strategies to, to handle that, as well as helping our officers recognize that it affects them too. And so they can use the way that it's affected them in building those relationships. We also hit um, alternatives to charging and restorative justice very, very hard because um, I don't think that we can ever emphasize that too much. And so I started my training with the officers. I asked them to write um, answers to a couple of questions on an index card and pass it up so that it was anonymous because I feel like you always get very honest answers when you ask for anonymous feedback in this situation. And so I asked them very simply, um, what they thought about their vision for the SRO program in the future, as well as how they feel that the recent events um, nationally will impact their ability to do their job. Um, and I think a lot of times when we think of how an officer would respond to that, we think about safety, right? That's all, always what we hear our officers talk about. While it was mentioned, the number one thread throughout every response was relationships. Our SROs miss being in the building because they miss their kids. Um, they are anxious to get back in the building because they, they are worried about their kids because they do have a good understanding of trauma and mental health and isolation. Um, so the picture that is on this slide um, is actually uh, the role of an SRO as defined um, in, by the training um, provided by the Maryland Center for School Safety. Um, so as you can see, law enforcer is, is a piece of it, but there's also several other pieces, educator, emergency manager, informal counselor. The educator piece and the informal counselor are the parts that um, when you ask it, our SROs about their vision, that's what they reflected on. And so I'm going to share with you um, because I, I, I could come up here and talk to you about uh, what they said, but I, I, I want you guys to hear it from themselves, for, from them. So one officer said, my vision of the SRO program is for it to be a mentoring, relationship building, informal counseling, educating program. I want us to be viewed as another adult that can add to a student's life and experiences. I think the recent events will have a large impact on our ability to develop relationships with students for a little while, but I believe we are highly trained and we will eventually overcome those obstacles if if we're allowed to get back into school. Um, I think being a positive influence role model for the children is an important role of an SRO. Then there's this, this one SRO who, who went above and beyond, but I, I, I can't help but share it with you. It says, my vision for the perfect SRO is one where the SRO spends very little time doing what many would consider to be traditional police work. The SRO should be a part of the school community. He or she should be someone that the students can turn to not only in times of crisis or emergency, but also in times of accomplishment and joy. In order to accomplish this, the SRO must build equity into his relationships with students and faculty. This requires walking the halls and grounds, interacting with students, and making every effort. I always prefer for my first time interacting with the student not to be during a moment of crisis for the student or when they're in trouble. I prefer to build trust and equity in a relationship so that in the event I'm called upon to interact with a student having a bad day, they do not see having to interact with me as a consequence, but rather as a diversion to a consequence. I strive to keep them out of trouble as best as I can, but I understand that that can only happen when students have some kind of positive interaction with me prior, in prior experiences. Um, he says he, he feels like SROs should be at the forefront of instilling trust back in police. 
uh, and he's prided himself on having honest and open dialogue with high school students about all aspects of police work, both positive and negative. I've spoken, about I've spoken in government classes about constitutional rights, police brutality, and helped explain to students the dynamics of police citizen interactions. I think that these conversations are necessary moving forward. And he, he wrote a lot more because this is something that they're very passionate about. But I just wanted to share with you their words that, that we have such a good group of SROs that I'm so very proud of, and they truly get it, and they want to be there in that relationship capacity. And I think our commitment to um, change and our efforts that we've put in, in, in having our officers understand restorative justice and trauma and really the commitment that our officers have to not being uh, punitive, if possible, is really reflected in our data. So even when you account for COVID closures, we still saw a, a reduction in school-based charging during the 19th school year of a, over 20%. Um, and unlike other jurisdictions with, who have seen an increase in racial and ethnic disparities um, when there was a school base, when there was a reduction in school based charging, that is not the case in Anne Arundel County. Um, so if you can look at this chart right here, um, the blue lines would be would be accounting for the number of school days that we actually went to school in, in 2019. Um, and I did a comparison, and it is over a 20% de uh, decrease, even if you account for COVID. That's what that red line um, demonstrates. So our efforts are working. Um, so we ask for uh, your patience in working with us. Um, we're not done improving. We're not done by any means. Um, so we are um, in communication uh, with Dr. Arlotto and the schools to see how we can improve even better once we, we get kids back in school. Um, but we just wanted to let you know that we weren't um, sitting by and, and wasting our time. We told you that we would work on it in March and we absolutely have. Thank you. Thank you so very much, Ms. Perkins. Greatly appreciated. And um, I can't thank you guys enough. Uh, definitely excellent work and progress report is, I believe, um, is going to go a long way to make that big difference. We may not be able to see that difference, you know, in the next couple months, but I know we're going to reflect back on this moment as a pivotal one. Thank you so very much. I'm going to open this up this time and roll call order because we're in virtual for our members. Um, but before I do, Ms. Perkins, was there um, uh, Major Goodwin or anybody else that wanted to uh, speak for a couple minutes or say anything before we proceed? No, I'm actually here just for moral support. Uh, I could not be any more proud of Ms. Perkins and Officer LeVere. They are truly the rising stars in our department. And I'm just proud of the work that they do for our juveniles and our counties in very good hands with them. I and mean, we're excited about moving forward, um, but thank you for having us. As always, we appreciate it. Thank you so very much for all your service and all you guys continue to do. Um, while we're tucked safely at home, you guys are on the front lines keeping us safe. So we have that, uh, we have the, uh, the wonderful blessing of being able to do that. So thank you. Thank you. Um, we're going to uh, go, as I said, in roll call order. And this evening, uh, we start with Mr. Gilliland. Mr. Gilliland. Thank you. I, I uh, have no questions. I appreciate the report um, and presentation tonight, Ms. Perkins. I remember your presentation back in March, I believe it was. You had, um, I believe it was three uh, young friends that you brought with you who were very compelling. And uh, above all, you know, certainly Major and, and Corporal, thank you for your, your work and effort here, um, uh, specifically here, but then more broadly, um, you know, what you do on a daily basis. But Ms. Perkins, um, you are the work beneath the iceberg. You know, we see the tip of the iceberg and I think the public sees that, but um, you do such amazing work. And I just wanna say um, thank you for all that you do and, and for the difference you make every day in, in the lives of, today's young people and tomorrow's leaders. Thank you so much, sir. Thank you, Mr. Gillen. Ms. Hummer? Um, yes, the same. I just wanna reiterate that I thought this was an incredibly 
um, detailed and rich presentation really showing us the data and how your programs are working. I um, love how you describe it as meaningful intervention and that we want to do pre-diversion for people and your, all of your data and results are showing that those things are working and it's making a difference for our kids and um, the comments that you read from the SROs themselves just back up everything that I've seen in my interactions with them and what I've heard from um, staff that works with them every day is how, how much the job means to them and what they are trying to do and the relationships they're trying to build. So again, I just thank you for your continued work on this. This is great progress. I love seeing the reduction in numbers and I appreciate the data-driven but people-centered approach that you're doing. Thank you so much. Thank you, ma'am. I'll pass that along to our SROs. Thank you, Ms. Hummer. Mr. Smith. Hello, Ms. Perkins. First, I want to say that was a very wonderful report. Um, it's good to see just so much progress going on. I especially want to say the teen court aspect. I have a good friend, you may know him, Peter Stevenson. Yes, sir. Um, he loves teen court. So I ever yes, talk he does. To him. Um, we love having him. And, you know, it's just fantastic just to see what it can do for students that are, you know, interested in all aspects of the legal profession and to keep students out of uh, trouble. It's really, you know, killing two birds with one stone. Um, and then to the, the work with the SROs, that was a very profound words that officer wrote. Um, it, it was just so moving. Um, can I ask what, do you know what school he's? Uh, so I, all I'm at liberty to say is that he is a high school SRO um, and he's been with that high school for several years. Very, very Im embedded in the community. Well, I, think, I think that passion, you know, it's just so good to know that we have officers that really just think that highly of their job. Um, but I will say, you know, in my four years at Mead High School, um, my interactions with my own SROs have been limited. I guess that says, says a lot about my own character, right? I don't need to interact with them, but, you know, it would still be nice, you know, just, um, you know, from hearing that, I wouldn't think that they um, just thought that highly of their job. And I'm really glad that you, you all are pushing towards, you know, more interactions, going back to, I guess, that officer-friendly approach, right? Everybody knows his name, they all know, it, and he knows everyone's name. Because, um, you know, students have those re relationships with custodial staff, um, um, school cafeteria staff, you know, pretty much every other person in the building. But sometimes, you know, the SROs are left out. So that's just so pleasing to hear. And um, I do have one question for you. Um, with the Minority Youth Council, uh, when I first heard about it, I made a post about it, you know, for all the other students to see and just sign up. But um, so is this, um, I know there's an application to it, but are you taking... Are you limiting the amount of spots on the Minority Youth Council or? No, sir. So um, what, and that is part of the reason why we um, extended the deadline is because there was some confusion over that and there was a lot uh, going on at the time. And so our community partners actually asked us to extend the deadline so that we could get it the, the attention that it, um, it, it deserves because there are a lot of people who do have a lot to say. Um, the uh, direction I've been given from my command staff is if there's somebody that has something to say, we want to hear it. And so there, there will be no one that we have had a very good turnout thus far. Um, but we, we want even more because we know that there are people out there that have things to say. Um, and this is an opportunity where, where we want to listen. Um, our, our SROs, our officers, I will say when I went out and I trained every single officer um, just this past fall and we mentioned this program and then we opened it up and said, Hey, you know, who would you, uh, or would you, who would like to be involved in it? And the outpouring of support from our officers even surprised me. Like it blew me away how many people instantly, as soon as the email went out, um, I don't even think a full minute went by before I had my first reply. And so if you know of anyone else, please continue to advertise it because we, everyone is an expert of their own experience. And therefore everyone has something relevant that they can share every community we want represented. And so please, 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 we will not cap it. We would like as much support as, as you can drum up for us. And that is fantastic. Cause I was worried about the cap and I want students, you know, with that experience to go with. So that is so very exciting to hear. Um, I will definitely now sign up myself. I didn't want to you know, take a spot away from somebody, but I will definitely sign up and keep on pushing. Cause this is just, um, you're doing amazing work. You know, you're, you're taking progressive actions and it's really, really exciting. So thank you for all you do. Thank you so much, sir. 
Thank you, Mr. Smith. Ms. Ellis? Thank you. Um, Ms. Perkins, it's always a pleasure to see you uh, with us. Um, I'm always impressed. Um, you're, first of all, when I was a candidate and an early board member, your name greatly preceded you. Your name came up a lot. And, um, and then when you presented to us last March, um, I, I understood why. <laughs> so thank you for all you're doing for our youth. As I re can recall um, in the time that I've been on the board, I think this is the third time we've had a presentation um, um, that involved our SROs, Mr. Uh, Batten um, presented to us one time early, um, shortly after I became a board member. But, um, you know, I, I understand the concerns that I hear sort of as a national conversation with SROs in our schools. But um, the more I learn about our SROs and now for the third presentation, I've seen the progress that continues to be made. Um, I really feel that we, we get it right in Anne Arundel County and um, the, the service that they provide for our students is just invaluable. Um, I you know, made a couple notes during your uh, presentation and um, it really struck me uh, the, the two boxes that um, were, uh, what was it, informal counselor and educator. I mean, that really, that defines it, you know, as far as the difference between having law enforcement in the school and having someone there who's actually truly there for the students. So um, that really struck me. And I greatly appreciate that you, you're bringing data because that really puts it in numbers for people to understand how many students are, are really being um, saved by, by these services. Um, their, their entire futures can be turned around. Um, that being said, um, for our, you know, there are still many members of the community that have a great deal of concern with having officers in our schools. And I do sometimes wonder, um, you know, just how much can you ensure the consistency of, of the attitude and the spirit with which these officers are in our school? So can you talk about the um, evaluation or review process? Is there an annual evaluation of our officers and who has input on that evaluation? It, and then a second part of, of my question is um, for our top officers, if you have identified mm -hmm. them, what opportunities do they have to share their best practices and perhaps mentor other officers? So I will answer some of that question um, and then I'll, I'll defer to Major Goodwin um, about some of it because it's just outside of my purview and I don't want to speak out of turn. I will say um, my uh, Captain Plitt Captain Plitt, um, who could not be here this evening, I, he was at the first presentation with me. Um, me and him, he's the captain over the SROs. Me and him have a weekly meeting um, and we discuss any issues because as you, as you mentioned, I'm a data person. I read every single um, juvenile report. I track the data weekly. And so if there are issues or concerns, we're gonna nip it early. And so me and him do stay in constant communication. Um, I am in constant communication um, with the school resource officers. Um, and, and so, and we meet regularly, we train regularly to ensure that those best practices do not stay isolated, that they do get shared. If I find national best practices, I'm gonna push it out. But if any, um, there's actually an email chain, if there are other things that they notice, they share it amongst themselves and until we can meet again. Um, but also I will meet with Captain Plitt weekly so that we can discuss areas uh, of um, concern as well as sp spread successes um, and make sure that it, it does roll out. Um, and that is something that he is very invested in um, and it has, has worked for us um, as far as progressing recently. Um, but I know he will often make the comment we may not always be perfect, but I don't think there's any department around that will try harder than us. And so we want to catch it early. Um, and we are always willing to hear feedback 
um, from the community members, from faculty and things like that. And, and we wanna hear it early so that we can fix it. Um, so uh, I don't necessarily know that that answers all of your question, but um, when it comes to that, there is a, a very open line of communication and there's our frequent uh, conversations about that because uh, we wanna be the best. And if there's a new practice out there, we wanna be the first. So Major Goodwin, um, if you can, can pick up for me. Yeah, absolutely. So, you know, I'll start with this. We know that not everyone can be a police officer. And we also know that not every police officer can be a school resource officer. And we recognize that. So it is a selective process. Um, officers do have to put in an application that has to go through the chain of command. There's an interview board. Um, there's questions that are asked. Um, and then it, we have to decide who we're going to select. Um, and that has to be approved by my level. The SROs fall under me. I have all the patrol, including our SROs. We're very selective on that officer. And those traits that you saw up on that one slide with those four categories, that's the type of officer that we're looking for. And that will shine through um, just from their experiences that they're already doing in the communities. Because all of our officers are supposed to be engaging with the youths out in the communities. So we hear about that. So we're very selective. Um, we're very selective on what officers go in what schools and what needs there are in those schools. And it's something we're constantly reassessing. Um, before it was even mandated with training, all of our SROs go through a 40 hour training. Um, so not only are they additionally the police training, but then once they are selected for an SRO, they go through 40 hours of specific training. A lot of it Tamika teaches that talks about all those things you've been seeing on our slides. They're then paired up with another SRO, so it's not like we put them in a school by themselves. They actually um, train with another SRO to kind of follow their lead before they go into a school on their own. And then we monitor them um, to see how they're doing. Supervisors are always going in. We have two sergeants and a lieutenant oversees our SRO program. So they're evaluating them and seeing how they're, they're doing. I'm um, talking to the school administrators, getting feedback from them, getting feedback from our students. Um, I go into the schools quite often and, and to watch them in action. And I'm impressed with them every single time I go into those schools. Um, but then there's additional ongoing training. So it's not just that initial training, but every year before school starts, Ms. Tamika gets them all together. We do training, not only just with the SROs, but we include the school administration. Um, we do training together with them also. So it's continuous. It's not just a one-time deal. And it's, it's constantly looking at our program and trying to make it the best we can. Um, understand what other agencies have reached out to us. We are the model for the training curriculum that we put together. So we now go out and train the other agencies um, using our curriculum model. So we've taken the lead on that. And I'm very proud of it. And that's because of the work of our supervisors, our SROs, and Ms. Tamika for sure. Miss um, Ellis. I, yeah, go ahead. I just wanted to add, um, we have really high hopes for our Minority Youth Advisory Council for that reason, because we want that input about how we can improve. And so our SROs are going to be involved in that program um, as well as patrol because it, like I said, we always want to get better. And so we, we are always willing to hear that feedback and um, anything that is shared with me, I certainly take back to both Captain Plitt, um, Lieutenant Johnson, and then, and then the SROs as well. Thank you. Um, yeah, I, I can just imagine that, um, you know, the, the, the best way to determine if an individual officer is getting that relationship aspect of their position right is, is to survey the school community in some way. Um, so it would be great if you do incorporate that um, into some sort of evaluation process. Have, do you recall any instances where you went through all this with an officer, identified them as someone who would be talented at this, and then they get in there and it just doesn't seem like a right fit? Um, since taking over the school resource officers has been about two years. I've not seen that. What I have seen is sometimes school resource officers get a little burnt out and they need a break. Um, yeah. That's more of what we see. You know, we've had SROs that have been there, some schools for 13, 15 years. Um, it's very demanding. Um, and it gets to the point where I think they just recognize, hey, you know what? I'm getting a little burnt out. I think I need to change. But um, as far as it not being a right fit, we haven't come across that yet. We're doing pretty good on selecting them and putting them in those rate schools. But I think the burnout is more of a, an issue when we see that turnover. Well, thanks again for an excellent presentation and especially for all that you're doing for our youth. Thanks. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Ellis. Mr. Granin. Uh, thank you, President Corkadell, and uh, thank you, Ms. Perkins. Uh, I just share the views of the uh, other board members. That's that certainly one of the 
best third party presentations that I've heard on the, uh, my, my time on the board. You gave a very impactful statistic about um, basically the, the high percentage of students who go into diversion who never have another contact with law enforcement. I don't remember the exact video, but 80% or, or something in that neighborhood comes to mind. And I'm just wondering, is there an analogous figure for students who don't go into diversion, how uh, often they come into contact again with law enforcement? So then, and this is not Anne Arundel County specific, this would be the uh, national data, is um, uh, between 45 and 55% of uh, students would, re or juveniles would reoffend in via traditional justice methods. Okay. That, that, that's kind of what I hope. That's a very significant delta. Anyway, thank you so much for everything that you're doing. It's, uh, it's just really amazing. Thank you, sir. Thank you, Mr. Glannon. Ms. Shawhan? Um, thank you so very much for your presentation. Just like last March, this one was um, wonderful and informative, and I'm so very grateful for it. I want to echo um, what my colleagues have said and their high praise uh, for you and your staff and for all the SROs. Um, I, I'm just really grateful for this partnership. Um, and I think it hinges uh, on on relationships, the same kind of relationships we talk about uh, between uh, our students and any other trusted adult in the building and how very important that is and how much that matters. Um, and and I, I love how they are, um, th that it's, uh, that the SROs are there, um, you know, searching for that, searching for um, the relationship with the student in a non-law enforcement sense uh, f first. And uh, and I, I just think that that's, guys, be quiet. Um, sorry, my family <laughs> uh, is very loud in the background. Um, and, uh, uh, and I really, I just think that that's wonderful. I'd, I had one question for you and that's about uh, diversity on the SRO force. Um, and uh, and what what um, how you're looking to uh, to match the diversity in our uh, in our uh, community, um, both in terms of uh, uh, race, ethnicity, and and gender. So if you can speak to that, I'd I'd love to hear it. Yeah, absolutely. We're always looking for that because we want you know our SROs reflect the population in those schools. So absolutely. That's what I was kind of alluding to as far as once we select that SRO, we really fit the needs of that school with that SRO. Um, you know, we just lost one of our great SROs to retirement, um, Corporal Vasquez, who was in our Annapolis Middle School because she speaks Spanish and that's a, a heavy populated uh, school with Spanish speaking students. So it was a great fit for her being in that school. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I'm talking about. So yeah, absolutely. We're always looking for diversity, especially when it comes to our SROs because we want them, I think, when we're relating to kids, they need to relate to someone that looks like them. And that helps a lot with uh, that relationship building part of it. So it's something that we're always having in the back of our head and we're always taking into consideration in that program for sure. But thank you for asking that. That's wonderful. And how many women uh, do we have on the, uh, within Anne Arundel County Public Schools in, a, in an SRO capacity at this point? Can, can you give me one second to check, ma'am? Yeah. Sure. I'm, yes. I'm, well, I'm, three, I'm a data person. I'm thinking three, if I can remember correctly. I know we only just lost one, so I might be off my numbers. So it was four, but we, we've since lost, lost one. one. Right. Okay. Um, well, um, like I said before, I'm really just, I'm very grateful for this partnership. I, I think it's, um, I think it's fabulous. I, uh, I look forward to its continuation in a brick and mortar setting once it's safe to do so. And uh, I'm, I just very grateful. So thank you so much for your wonderful presentation. And it's always wonderful to see you. Thank you, ma'am. Thank you, Ms. Shawheim. Ms. Antoine. Ms. Antoine, you're muted. Ms. Antoine, if you could, um, there we go. <laughs> I hope someone's keeping track. So, so I'm, I'm coming, I'm coming through via the phone. I'm, I'm definitely having audio trouble here. So can you guys hear me now? 
Yes, ma'am. I can definitely what? hear you and no no hurries on that. No, no hurries, okay, no worries. Thank you so much. Um, to Major Goodwin, Ms. Perkins, and the young corporal, thank you. You came on sharing, uh, and a congratulations to Chief Lowry as well. Um, you guys came on presenting some real reality that, one, you guys are stretched, and yet you continuously do the job that you've been blessed to take on, and you voluntarily stepped up to protect and serve. Thank you for that. Um, last um, last March, we, the Board of Education put forth a, a motion that was passed that the citation and arrest report that you all, well, I should say Ms. Perkins, that you painstakingly generated be presented to us each November. I so sincerely appreciate this report and am looking forward to the uh, more detailed data that you uh, alluded to earlier in the presentation. So I am amazed that with all the negative that has realistically been out there about the police in general, the, what the, uh, as well as the protest and the um, I would say the death of George Floyd, it is difficult to build trust and relationships when you are a young person witnessing such hate. To see your presentation, I commend you highly that you did not fail to continue the work that you have strived to do and the change that you are continuously making. Thank you again. My question would be about recruitment. Uh, witnessing what our youth have witnessed. They may not want to grow up to be police officers uh, the same way that they may have before they witnessed some of what they've witnessed. How old do you have to be to join uh, the police force? There is no age requirement. Um, so we've had, you know, anyone from 21 years of age in our police academy to the oldest that I can remember was I was at the academy to 53 years old. You just have to be able to pass every. So anyone out there that's in their 50s, don't say you can't become a police officer now. <laughs> I've seen it happen and they've been very good and very successful. You just have to be able to pass certain, the criteria, but there is no age requirement. Are you looking for a new job? I have several. <laughs> Not only pay what I want them to pay, but I have several. Thank you. But I do know a youth that may be interested Please. in joining the force in order to change the narrative and to better understand from the internal side of things how best to, to protect and serve and the realities of that service. And that was the reason for the question made you go. When you couldn't get me on that one, you guys well, wouldn't want me anyway. I don't run as well as I do. <laughs> well, thank you for asking that. And, and we are accepting applications right now. So uh, please tell that gentleman to put in. We're definitely hiring. Yes, ma'am. And then um, my, my second question would be about the data you mentioned uh, being intentional and the Fresh Start program. I appreciate those programs. How, based on everything that has gone on in 2020, how uh, effective have the programs been in your opinion and what can the school system do to help more um, students be part of those programs? So uh, Ms. Antoine, can you repeat your question? You, you broke up just uh, right as you asked the first part. Yes, ma'am. The question is about the programs you presented to us which have changed uh, have increased since March, and I, I commend you for that as well. I was asking how the school system can help get more students involved in those programs. 
So I will say um, with regard to the Minority Youth Advisory Council, which is um, one of the new programs that you mentioned, the school system has been a great partner. Um, so once again, thank you, Mr. Smith, as the student representative for sending it out. Um, and we've had a lot of um, help with um, from PPWs, assistant principals, um, as well as um, uh, Ms. Rockefeller um, at the school board, um, restorative justice. Um, we're, those are great partners that have helped us get the recruitment. Um, the student turnout has been really, really um, good. I, I've been very impressed and, and the quality of the applications and the passion that the students have and the mention of the fact that um, there are conversations that are occurring in the school that is promoting them and, and pushing them towards having the conversations with us um, has been phenomenal. Um, and so I, I want to put that out there because it has it has truly made a difference. Um, and, and Major Goodwin, um, as far as uh, um, any other programs, I will I will defer. Yeah, I mean I echo exactly what you said. Um, we can't do this job alone, just like with anything else. Um, it, it's a partnership. And it's a partnership with every agency, every department in this county, the schools. I've been a wonderful partnership with the police department. We do everything in tangent. We train together. We talk constantly. We run things by each other. So I can't be um, more proud of that relationship. It's continuous. Um, it's like any other relationship. It, it requires attention, time, patience, trying to hear both sides, um, and then coming to some compromises sometimes. But you know, I think we're very fortunate in this county that we have very good and strong and deep relationships. Um, not just with the school, but all the entities in this department, in the, the county. And that's half the battle right there, the communication. And, and Ms. Antoine, I will, I will also say um, when it comes to, to feedback, that's, that's always helpful. And so I, I, every uh, member of the board has my contact information. Um, and so any, any input from you guys would be extremely helpful. Um, I hope that I've proven between March and now that we take that input very seriously and, and we're trying to build that trust and, and um, we don't, we don't stop. We don't slow down. So, so please, uh, I will extend that to you as well. Yes, ma'am. I personally had no doubt. And I, I have always appreciated uh, the Anne Arundel County police department and everything you all do. I thank you very much for this time. And my um, my appreciation, and as well as my condolences. Thank you guys very much. Thank you Thanks so much, ma'am. Thank you, Miss Antoine. Mr. Lyde. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I, I have no questions. I'd just like to join my colleagues in their very supportive comments, Ms. Perkins, and. Uh, one thing I know, you all are very dedicated to the support of the students in Anne Arundel County. And for that, we are all very, very grateful. Thank you. Thank you so Thank much, you. sir. Thank you, Mr. Ladd. Um, I, as a, as a member, do have a couple um, things. First, to uh, thank you guys so very much once again. Um, I know our partnership goes a long way to uh, making such a huge difference in so many students' lives. And that remains continual. I just wanted to comment that um, I was very encouraged to hear about our trauma-informed updates and how they are woven, well woven in. Um, I, I've been asked to join a couple communities of late in the last several weeks. Um, and what um, was seemingly outside of the box, but very appropriate, particularly in this moment in time, is how many people were asking us, including uh, one of um, my former, not my child um, partners, Miss Latoya, <laughs> um, and um, as to the update on on training of trauma informed and how uh, how far we've come since she has last engaged both our wellness committee here at the school system as well as what you guys are up to, and I told her to just hang tight and stay informed because I, I had a feeling we were going to hear some, some great progress information and most certainly we did. So um, thank you so very much because I, I really do think that's where uh, the concerns are right now is um, how we capture um, 
those children experiencing, uh, whether it's, uh, you know, substance use going on in the household or of a sibling and the abuse and the SROs are the front line. And that is probably one of my largest concerns rolling into this next winter months is how we're going to address that. And knowing that you guys are there partnered with us goes a very long way to ensure that that I know each and every single minute we're doing the best we can. So, so ma'am, just an update on, on that. Um, I know um, we were talking in March about the Handle with Care program. Um, we just recently went out and um, trained every single officer on every single shift um, with the support of command staff um, on the Handle with Care program. And we stress to them that right now um, we are the eyes and ears and um, it's more important than ever to make sure that the, those notices come in every single time so that we can link them to services, especially while we have the extra bodies with our uh, crisis intervention team. And so um, I'm confident that, that they understood because we have done so much trauma training with them. And so um, we are getting those notices. We are continuing to send those notices. I meet with uh, or have a phone conversation with Lieutenant Thomas excuse me, who is over our crisis intervention team very regularly to make sure that um, whatever we can do, um, because we know how uh, pivotal it is in this time, whatever we can do, we're doing. And um, of course, we're, we're always willing to, to think outside of the box about how we can do more for sure. So um, uh, if you can please share that update with uh, on those committees that you're on, ma'am. Thank you. Thank you. I am uh, certainly going to, because that, that to me is is progress and hopeful news. We could all use a little bit of hope. Um, but I just had one other question. I don't mean to take up everybody's time, but I'm watching these emerging numbers on substance use and opioid and the fatalities of opioid. And I know that that has a direct impact. Um, you guys are also not just our eyes and ears for um, you know, the domestic component, comports, but that opioid use and substance use. Could, could you just say a couple words to that on, on how um, our SRO program is um, continuing? I mean, you guys are on the front lines on that. So I don't know if it's a, more of a comment than a question. It's not necessarily a question, but um, I gotta say it's, it's startling and I think it's gonna, it's gonna rise. And I think we're gonna see a spark, a sharp spike. So, yeah. so I can speak on the juvenile side and then um, again, I'll defer to Major Goodwin for the adult side to, uh, just so I don't speak out of turn. Um, we have, as a unit, have developed a partnership with the Pathways Program um, and we work um, with the Substance Abuse Prevention Coalitions as well. Um, but uh, with our um, uh, working with the Pathways Program, that is a mandated consequence because we want to we want to make sure that uh, we can get them as early as possible. Um, um, handle with cares are not limited to, handle with care notices are not limited to domestic situations. It would be anytime there's a law enforcement presence. Um, so that would include if there was a witnessing of an overdose or, or other issues like that. Um, so it's not just on the domestic side. So we, we do recognize that as trauma. Um, I, the handle with care program actually started excuse me, out of uh, Kanawha County, West Virginia, in response to the opioid crisis. Mm -hmm. So that is certainly something that um, numbers, while I, I never know what the hand, what triggered the handle with care notice, um, that is something that certainly would trigger that. Um, mm -hmm. And those partnerships with um, Pathways, as well as the monitoring of handle with care notices has continued throughout, during COVID, um, throughout COVID. And so uh, I can't give you data on that information because I don't know what sparks the handle with care but I know that it would absolutely, it would absolutely trigger one. Yeah, and I, I wasn't looking for the data numbers. I just, I think it's important for us to recognize and to at least start a conversation because I, 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 I'm unfortunate, it's, it's unfortunate, but I know that the coming months, holidays were always the hardest. I know, um, and that's where we would receive, you know, the most the, the largest responses from not my child and some of the others in general. And, you know, I remember going into those high schools and how many kids were lo just looking to seek the relief. And it is really hard for me to visualize recognizing how hard it was for them to do this in person um, to have that additional barrier. And I know we're, ju we're just going to have to continue to work harder on it. 
Yeah, and I, I know that um, both the County Executive's Youth Advisory Council, which I've had the opportunity to work with, as well as our Youth Advisory Council, that is something um, that will be discussed because I think a lot of times um, when we talk uh, prevention or res response and intervention to um, the opioid, opioid crisis, we talk a lot about what we're going to do for kids, but the youth voice is oftentimes missing from the conversation. And so I'm really hoping that with these new youth centered um, interventions, or excuse me, youth centered initiatives, we will be able to, to say, okay, what's going to work? What, mm -hmm. what is needed? And so um, I think that's a, an area where we don't have much answer now, but I'm hopeful that we'll have, have a better handle on it in the future. Well, I'm seeing how we've moved mountains together in the past and how you guys in particular have moved many a mountain. And I'm confident that we'll be able to uh, traverse the one and move the next if we need to together. So thank you guys so very much. And I, I have no more questions. I'll just uh, ask um, any additional members, any follow-up. Uh, we still have quite a bit of business to conduct, but uh, okay, seeing that movement. No, no. Oh. I unmuted. Um, okay, um, I unfortunately in, in our newer platform do not have the recognition of all the members right at my fingertips uh, like we had in the previous. So yes, Michelle. Hunt. Thank you. Um, just, uh, just a couple very, very quick follow-up questions um, regarding um, the schools that our SROs are in, are they, are they currently or if we were back in brick and mortar, would they currently be in all high schools and middle schools at this point? Are there any that, that don't have uh, coverage? Yeah, so when schools go back, and we have them in all of our high schools, we have them in all of our middle schools, except for two of the middle schools. Um, and those are campuses where the high school and the middle school are right next to each other. So the one SRO kind of goes back and forth. When school year begins, we are committed to put an SRO in every one of our middle schools. Um, and, and that would include also the Crofton High School. So yes, the goal when kids go back, we'd have one in every one of the high schools and middle schools. Fantastic. And then um, how does it work regarding the relationship with the, um, the city police department? Can, I, I don't represent District 6, I represent District 5, but I, I just wanna know a little, just a tiny bit about that. Um, so with regard to, to juvenile operations, we work very, very closely with um, Annapolis City Police Department. Um, they assist us with all of our diversion efforts. They um, participate in all of our diversion efforts. And so um, any student who is charged in Annapolis City um, by Annapolis City Police is um, uh, all of our resources are available to, to that youth as well. We have a, a very um, strong and collaborative relationship with them with regard to all of our programs. Yes, ma'am. Fantastic. So all of the, the juveniles would be um, able to uh, uh, take part in all of the programs that you uh, offer, even if they reside within the city of Annapolis. Yes, ma'am. All of them are Fantastic. afforded the same opportunity. for the diversion. Wonderful. Thank you so much. Um, appreciate the, the last little bits of follow-up. Great. Thank you very much, Michelle Heim. Once again, Ms. Perkins, I can't say enough um, for you and your team, and please express our sincere gratitude and appreciation on behalf of the board. You guys are working so, so hard and making such a great difference. And Major Goodwin, always a pleasure working with you um, and looking forward to um, hearing from you guys again, um, hopefully pretty soon, maybe uh, sometime in the late spring, uh, based on, uh, you know, to look, see at the calendar. And um, obviously if you have a need, and um, I know Dr. Alano and his team have an excellent working relationship with you guys. Uh, Dr. Alano, before uh, we conclude, did you have uh, anything you wanted to say uh, to the team? Yes, ma'am. Certainly, I'll always take the opportunity to um, uh, to talk so positively about our SRO unit. They truly are amazing. Um, uh, you've heard me say it before, and certainly over the last fifteen years, it's been a fabulous relationship. Um, uh, the what what Miss Perkins read, um, which was so powerful from two of the SROs during that that they shared 
uh, during their training is what you see, it was what you truly see in the buildings when you see them interacting. Um, that is what you see on a daily basis, is them building relationships. Um, uh, it is fabulous for Mrs. Perkins and the team uh, to share not only their focus on training and accountability, which are important, um, uh, but to hear them talk about trauma-informed and making sure the officers know from which direction they're coming and the students are, a, a sole focus on restorative practices is incredibly important. And this is all wrapped up in educating our students, right? We know our young people are going to make bad decisions. It's part of growing up. And so we need them to learn from that. And so to have the support of our SRU, uh, SRO unit and the uh, police department overall um, has just been fabulous as we are working to educate our students. That's what we do together. Um, so the diversion programs have certainly been helpful uh, in that, but it all wraps up in what so many of you have talked about uh, and Ms. Perkins talked about so eloquently, which is building relationships. Our SRO unit does a fabulous job of building relationships uh, every day and, and with the students and with the staff. They truly are parts of the staff of those buildings. They are seen as staff members. So uh, I thank Ms. Perkins uh, and Corporal Lashier. Uh, certainly always good to see you, Major Goodwin, and Captain Plitt for his leadership with the SRO unit. Uh, we're very thankful. So thank you. Thank you, sir. Once again, our condolences to the police community. Um, I know that one of the reasons that you guys are so successful is because you're such a close family. So um, please extend that uh, to Chief Lowry and um, tell him thank you very much for everything. And uh, look, we look forward to our continued partnership. Thank you guys so very much. Absolutely. Thank you. Thank you. Next is item 4.02, the 2021-2022 school year calendar presentation. And this evening, um, Mr. Mosier, um, our uh, Chief of Communications here at AACPS uh, will be leading this presentation. Mr. Mosier, please. So thank you, President Corkadell. Uh, for the record, Bob Mosier, uh, Chief Communications Officer, here to present item 4.02, which is the presentation of the recommendations of the calendar committee for the 2021-2022 school year calendar. Um, the committee did ask that some of its members have a chance to speak. So at the end of this presentation, um, you'll hear from Mara Bob and Beckett Hummer, who are the two students who served on our committee, and from Mallory LaFon, who represented uh, the Anne Arundel County Council of PTAs on the committee. And then we'd be happy to answer any questions you have. Uh, let me try to share my screen here and get to this PowerPoint, and we will get moving. Okay, so the calendar committee um, is made up of a mix of uh, school system employees and representatives from our uh, bargaining units and uh, parent and student groups. So every uh, bargaining unit is extended two invitations to attend the committee and then CAC, PTA and CRAS get to each. And then there's one representative each from the departments um, that you see there. Um, contrary to prior years um, where the committee has presented a calendar this year, uh, the members decided to present you with a singular priority about which they were unanimous. And that was to make Easter spring break um, a full six days. So the entire week before Easter plus uh, Easter Monday. Um, so the committee has provided you with two options that incorporate that. Um, their top priority is one on which classes begin on August the 30th and end on the 14th of June. And the second uh, classes begin on the 8th of September and end on the 21st of June uh, for students. Um, they made two other recommendations. Um, one is to move parent-teacher conferences later um, than they are in 2020, 2021. Um, in the fall, they were October 12th and 13th uh, this year. And so we'll talk about where they place them in just a minute. And the second is that families should be given the choice of conducting parent-teacher conferences, either virtually or in person. Um, I will tell you that anecdotally, the, the feedback from our principals um, was that they were thrilled with uh, the virtual conferences and the participation this year, and parents uh, as well um, found that um, very helpful. Um, so on to the calendars. Um, so the first, the, the top priority calendar has teachers returning to buildings on the 19th of August. 
Uh, the first class day of class for students, as I mentioned, is the 30th of August. Uh, the calendar does build in the four equity professional development days, which are two hour early dismissals as they have been for a number of years. Um, there are three parent teacher conference days, two in October and, and one in March. That March date as is the case this year is the conditional um, day um, that we would convert to a school day um, if weather became a factor. Um, the October dates are split again uh, as they are this year with one day all students are off and the other day uh, elementary and middle school students are off uh, for parent teacher conferences. Also in that calendar is a three day Thanksgiving break, um, the six day Easter spring break as I mentioned, I mentioned the two inclement weather days. The school year would end for students on the 14th of June and the last day for students would be the 15th of June. Um, the committee's uh, second priority incorporates all the same conference um, break days, equity professional development days, and inclement weather days, and then makes these changes. Uh, teachers return to their buildings on the 26th of August. The first day of class for students is the 8th of September. The last day, the 21st for students and the 22nd for teachers. Um, you all will recall that last February, the board approved a motion um, that required the committee to bring at least one calendar that incorporates uh, Edel Fitter as a professional development day. And so the committee did that, um, they brought you two. Um, but what they did was they modified um, each of the two calendars that I've just talked to you about um, by adding a student day to the end of the year and then moving the last day for teachers back a day so that teachers and their school year the day after students and then eliminating one teacher work day prior to the start of classes for students. Um, so there would be five, I believe it's five teacher work days instead of six um, in that scenario. Uh, we then talked about whether anyone on the committee wanted to make either of these calendars a priority over the two I've just described to you uh, and no one um, advocated uh, for doing that. So that's a brief um, synopsis of the calendars and I will stop sharing my screen now and I will turn it over uh, to Ms. Babb followed by Ms. Hummer and Ms. LaFon for some comments. Thank you. Good evening, President Corkadell, Vice President Ellis, Dr. Alato, and members of the board. My name is Mara Babb. I'm the Krask Middle School Coordinator, and I was a student representative and committee member along with Beckett Hummer on this year's calendar committee. As Mr. Moser has previously stated, previously stated it was a calendar, it was the committee's main priority to implement a week-long spring break as reflected in the calendar recommendations. This decision is most beneficial to all students celebrating the holidays and getting a fresh start for the fourth marking period. The repercussions of this decision reflects a change in the start date and end date of the 2021-2022 school year. The priority one calendar shows that the start date will be on August 30th before Labor Day and the end date, taking into consideration the three extra snow days, will be on June 14th for students. I believe that this calendar is the best outcome for the week-long spring break decision because elementary school students and sixth and, eighth, sixth and ninth grade students will be starting on a school day on Monday, which is desired over a Wednesday. The ending date for students on priority one will be on June 14th, taking into account the three snow days. If we start school on September 8th after Labor Day, as stated in the priority two calendar, school will end for students on June 21st, a full week later. School will end over halfway into June, much later than it has ended in previous years, and is an undesirable outcome for students. I'm aware that this board has preferred the school commences after Labor Day, but Priority 1 is much more viable than Priority 2 for students. Thank you for your time. Hello, board. Um, good evening again. Um, so I'm here to advocate just on our reasoning and our decision behind moving the two um, future conferences days back and keeping them full days versus uh, two hour dismissal. So we moved them from this year, they were um, October 12th, 13th, around that time. And now we moved them back to 21st through 22nd. Um, we had a big discussion on this, whether to move it to November, to October, really where to put these dates. Um, but in the end, it came down to it's unfair for all students no matter what their grade level is. So the elementary and middle school had the concern that the um, 
that this teachers wouldn't know their kids as well um, having earlier in the year. So they're giving the parent teacher conferences, but they don't really know the kid as well as they could. So they don't have proper feedback. Um, so in moving it back, we were able to give about a week more to know your kid right before testing happens, but still have it in the first marking period, which is really important for high schoolers, because some of these classes that, that they are taking are only one semester, and that's a credit course. So if your um, parent teacher conference is in the second quarter, you're already halfway through your whole class, and it's not enough time to really catch up on what you're falling behind on, what you're missing on, and to really get proper feedback from your teachers. So that's just the reasoning behind that decision. And after this, if on speaks, we're more than happy to hear your questions and concerns. Hello again. Um, and for the record, my name is Mallory Lafon, and this time I'm representing the calendar committee as the AACCPTA rep. Um, as a parent and member of the calendar committee, it was important to include a start date before Labor Day, so um, AACPS could be similar to surrounding counties. It was also important for seniors, especially athletes, who, ha who head off to college earlier in the summer. The earlier end date of June 14th gives them extra time to prepare to leave for school and or training. It was also a priority to include full day parent teacher conferences later in October to make sure all families have the opportunity to speak with instructors about their students' performance with time to make corrections before report cards go out. Having conferences later in the quarter gives, gives families meaningful data with assessments and graded work to give a well-rounded evaluation of a student's performance. And finally, having a full week of spring break is also a priority because it gives a mental health break for students, staff, and families. A long weekend is not a sufficient for travel or for a chance to relax and reduce stress. More importantly, for quality teacher retention and recruitment, we pay less, so we need to show staff we value them with a full spring break. Um, surrounding districts that pay more also have a full week off. And I, like Beckett said, uh, after we're done speaking, um, um, welcome questions. So Madam President, we'll turn it back over to you. Thank you very much, um, greatly appreciated. Uh, before we begin, I just wanna make an announcement to make sure it's clear. Um, you'll note that our presentations are not action items. The board will be um, taking a potential action on is scheduled to on January the 4th at their very first board meeting. And so at that time, that would be on the agenda as an action item at the discretion, of course, of our new president. So um, with that stated, we are going to go round robin with questions. And Mr. Moser, you can just use roll call if you'd like, um, so that if the questions are directed at your guests and other individuals, it may make it go flow a little uh, easier. So, right. mm -hmm. so I believe we start with Mr. Gilliland. Yes, sir. Thank you, Mr. Mosher uh, and, and everyone for the presentation to the calendar committee. I won't be here for the vote, so I am not going to ask any questions. I'll defer to my colleagues. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Hummer. Um, yes, I appreciate the recommendation from the committee to maintain virtual and in-person um, options for, for teachers, I mean, for parents, because I think that did increase. I know as a parent of multiple children, I was never able to make all the conferences when I had to go between schools, but virtually I would be able to because I wouldn't have to drive. I would be able to schedule it all, and I know that's better. I also... Um, one of the points that was raised was keeping the um, conference days a full day instead of an early dismissal. Um, I think that that's really important as well because early dismissal doesn't give as much time. Plus, many of our parents schedule their conferences for 7.30 in the morning or 8 o'clock you know, before the, the day. And to give the maximum flexibility for our parents' schedules, I think a full day is important. So I appreciate that. I also... I, I think we all agree a full week of spring break would be great. So as Mr. Gilliland said, I won't be here to vote on this, but I did want to state those things that I think are real positives about this calendar um, as we move forward. And I think, as we've said, there's some good things that are going to, that we have all learned and, and realized from COVID. And one of those is the benefits of virtual conferences 
um, with our parents and the increase in participation that can bring. So I've, I'm glad to see the committee um, is recommending that as well. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Yes, um, I'm looking at the, well, first of all, and before I get ahead of myself, uh, fantastic work, a lot of work went into this. Um, really, really like what we've come up with, but um, the priority 2A, Eid al Fitter, we can only, uh, the start date is later if we include that, right? But we can't do that with an earlier um, start date. No, priority 1A is the earlier start date. So priority 1A, the 1A calendar takes the priority 1 calendar and modifies it to include Eid al Fitter. And, prior, and the 2A calendar takes the priority 2 calendar and modifies it. Oh, okay. Sorry, I must have completely overlooked it. You know, when I was looking at it yesterday, I was, I was wondering, but um, no, okay. That makes a lot of sense. Thank you, Mr. Mosier. Sure. Um, Ms. Ellis. Thank you. And first, I, I want to thank the calendar committee for your uh, hard work. I clearly put a lot of thought and consideration, um, and I appreciate you presenting options. Um, I have a few questions, and um, please don't anyone take any of my questions as suggestions. I just see this as an opportunity to think outside the box and explore all possibilities since we will be considering this for a period of time before we um, take action later. Um, for parent-teacher conferences, I have a, um, a couple of questions. One is, um, you know, currently we have schedule in the virtual environment where our students are, um, actively engaged in full day of classes, Monday, Tuesday, Thursday, Friday, and Wednesday, um, they have reduced in-person learning and they are um, um, doing work and assignments more on their own. Um, would that be a possibility for, um, is that possible to do with parent-teacher conference days, have those days that students are working at home? So um, I'll let the committee members answer after I give you this brief um, answer. We didn't discuss at all whether the calendar was based on virtual learning or in-person learning, right? We, the, the committee built the calendar based on what it thought was best for students. Um, as Ms. Hummer said, um, there was an extensive discussion about the parent-teacher conferences and whether to leave them as full days, whether to try to put them in on two hour early dismissal days. It's difficult to make that work because uh, for a couple of reasons. One, um, as, as several um, folks pointed out in, on the committee, trying to switch from instruction in the morning to conferences in the afternoon is difficult for some teachers. Um, but two is the sheer time factor. So if you take a six hour school day on which you could have conferences and you do a two hour early dismissal, even with the extra hour that teachers stay, that's three hours. So you need two days, you know, to accomplish those two October days, you would probably need three early dismissal days, right? To even come close to that. And the March day, you would need a second day. So um, that's probably a little more than you asked for, but, um, but we did not talk about the, the early virtual day on Wednesday, um, specifically. Right, so I'm, I'm asking, um, this isn't really of the calendar committee, it's asking, I'm asking right now what we, what we can do. Is there a reason we can't do it that way? Again, none of my questions are, are suggestions, they're questions. I understand. Um, so oh, is there, I, excuse me? Oh, do you mind if I answer the question? Yeah, no, I, but I was asking sort of from the legal aspect of what, of what we're required to offer to our students on, on a given school day. Is there a reason they can't? I'm not asking if we should or shouldn't. I'm asking, can we offer instruction, or have students work from home on a Wednesday and have that be a conference day? So okay. I'll, I'll let um, Dr. Alato weigh in on the state piece of it, but there is a minimum number of seat hours 
right? In addition to a number of days, you have to have a number of hours. So if you have too many two hour early dismissals, just as an example, you're gonna run into trouble with, with the hours. I don't know whether the state has weighed in, and perhaps Dr. Arlotto can, can say about converting that time, you know, the virtual learning time and how, what counts as a school day and what doesn't. Right, thank, thank you, Mr. Moser. You're absolutely right. The state is uh, considering, um, the superintendents have asked for a consideration and some guidance on, um, uh, on uh, how best to put it, the, what a virtual day would equal in terms of uh, an in-person day, which is, I think, what you're asking. I think what you're saying is, could we just say, and I'm making this up for conversation's sake, uh, Ms. Ellis, um, um, could we um, have a Wednesday that's an all-day parent-teacher conference day, but not be a day off for students? They would be at home doing an asynchronous day of learning, mm -hmm. I think is what you are suggesting. And we would we don't have yet a ruling on that. I mean, the, because we've not been in that situation. Right. Um, the superintendents are asking that similar question now, uh, uh, just in uh, for planning purposes for this year. Should we have weather events right. where we would need to officially close the system, but students could still be at home in either a synchronous learning environment with their teacher or an asynchronous learning environment? And would that count as a school day? Right. And, and that's a long-winded answer to, we don't have an answer to that question. Do you know when we can get an answer to it? Because that was my next I, question was, yeah, I don't. was inclement. Uh, it's, it's, it's continuously talked about with okay. the superintendents. And so um, uh, we'll continue to ask the state for some guidance on that. Uh, because as you know, in the current circumstance that we're in across the state, there is a three and a half hour mandate of synchronous learning per day on an average throughout the week. Right. So how the state would view an asynchronous day during parent-teacher conferences or during a snow day uh, is, is exactly what we're asking that. And it could be extrapolated to your point regarding parent-teacher conferences into the future. Right. So yeah, that was one of my questions was inclement weather. Do we need to build in inclement weather days? So that's something that we don't know yet. So, so as of now, the answer to that question is yes. Um, we, we are required to build in um, uh, those inclement weather days. So that's, we have to show a minimum of three in our calendar. That's by Com that's Comar, correct, Mr. Mosier? I believe so, yes. So we are required, so in our calendars, term, when, when a board of education finalizes a calendar, we of course send it up to MSDE for their final approval. And we have to have a minimum of three days uh, designated as um, inclement weather days. Now the so, question that, would be, could we not use an inclement weather day, I think as you're asking, and use a virtual day in its place? And that sure. again, I don't have an answer to. So that basically that, that code was written prior to okay. COVID and <laughs> when we were able to offer this amazing choice. <laughs> Of course. So, okay. Virtual learning. Right. Okay. Yep. Yeah. And then um, it was suggested that um, early dismissal days um, take away an opportunity for parents who meet, um, who need to schedule um, early conferences. Um, but assuming that we had to do two shorter school days instead of one day off, is there any reason we couldn't do? And again, not suggestions, just questions. Is there any reason we couldn't do one early dismissal and one late arrival? So we had that very discussion um, among the calendar committee. Um, and several years ago, um, we did a survey of parents, and it's been a number of years now, about the two-hour late arrivals. And um, there was the Parent Involvement Advisory Council was almost unanimously against that. But from a more practical point of view, a two hour early dismissal would get you three hours of conferences, right? Because teachers stay in there. A two hour late arrival gets you two hours of conferences. Right. 
Um, and then I, I think that's it, but let me just make sure. Um, oh, one more question. Do conference days, because I, I heard that the conference days that were selected for October from the calendar committee sounded like maybe perhaps a bit of a compromise to the needs of elementary and secondary students. Is there any reason that conference days cannot be on different days for elementary and for secondary schools? Um, well, I, I think transportation might be a reason there, um, bus transportation, right? Because you're not trans, so the days, so for example, October 22nd, if you're looking at the priority one calendar, you're not taking any students to school, right? On that day. So if you, if you took, if you split that, let's just say, you would, on the day that you had high school conferences, you're still making elementary and middle school bus runs on the day or days, right? And then the flip side is, is true as well. Um, I mean, it, I guess the short answer is, I don't think there is a reason, but it might come with some other ramifications that we need to explore. Okay, that's all my questions. Thanks so much, everyone. Thanks again, calendar committee. Mr. Granin. Yeah, I just wanted to make sure I was trying to follow it. So you were just pointing out it could have an impact on the bus transportation. You weren't pointing that out as an impediment, right? Because there's nothing in the contracts that would necessarily prohibit that. I don't, I'm not familiar enough with the contracts to give you an answer to that question, but I, but you, your first part of your statement is correct. I was just pointing out that there may be some ramifications to splitting the conferences that we need to explore further. Okay. All right. Good suggestion by Ms. Ellis, at least for consideration. Uh, my only question is, did I remember, I remember last time in particular as to the start date for school and whether it be before Labor Day or after Labor Day, you know, there was a, uh, a family survey that was pretty, you know, meaningful to a lot of board members. I'm just wondering, did the committee give any thought to uh, another survey? We did not discuss a survey. Okay, but that, you know, that's still possible. Sure. Mm -hmm. Okay, thanks very much. Sure. Ms. Schalheim. Uh, yes, thank you. Um, firstly, I wanted to say Thank you to the calendar committee um, for your hard work. I know that it's um, a puzzle and uh, and a lot of work to put this together. So I wanted to express my gratitude. I wanted to, um, and some of my colleagues already asked my questions for me. So thank you. <laughs> we great minds think alike, I guess. Um, but I wanted to go back to the question of, um, parent-teacher conferences and their import on during particular times for various levels. So if I'm hearing it correctly, I'm hearing that um, elementary school teachers may or may not know their kids as well by that time in October, but for a high school student, who's doing this for credit and it's a one semester class, it's more important to have the um, conference earlier. Is that is that an accurate summation of what I think I heard? I think that's an accurate summation of some of the variety of feelings among members of the committee. Okay. So knowing that, and also coming at this from the elementary world, um, just personally, I, is there any reason why the elementary or part of the elementary conferences couldn't be moved later, um, maybe into November, where they were for what I assume was a number of years. Um, can you can you speak to that a little bit? Like, so, so that was a that was a that was a conversation had um, at the calendar committee meeting, and it was um, I sent the board an email. Um, with um, an idea proffered by one of the two TAC representatives on the committee, which was to do that, which was to have one day in October and then the two days preceding um, Thanksgiving break, and that would make up your three days. Now, the committee didn't favor that because they, want, they generally wanted conferences 
um, earlier. And, and as Ms. Hummer said, to make an impact on first marking period grades. Um, um, but, but that conversation involved a two hour early dismissal and my committee members can tell me if I'm, if I mischaracterize this, it involved a two hour early dismissal in October and two, two hour early dismissals on the Monday and Tuesday of Thanksgiving week in November. They weren't complete days off there. And so there was some concern about whether parents would, given two hour early dismissals on Monday and Tuesday, A, whether parents would take advantage of the conferences at all, and B, whether their children would come to school at all, and what the absentee rate there would be. Right. Um, can you speak to the attendance rate for elementary school conferences in October? Is, is that a highly attended event, or, or do the do the teachers struggle to fill those slots? Yeah. I don't. I don't have numbers in front of me tonight. I can tell you from the principals that I've spoken to um, that their conferences were better attended at all levels um, this year with the virtual conferences than they have ever been. Right, and I don't dispute that. I think that it should go without without saying that it should be. Um, uh, a choice between in-person and virtual. We have the technology now. Um, uh, it's fabulous. Um, if you, as Ms. Hummer said, if you have children at multiple schools, it makes life so much easier. I, I'm not even sure the board needs to to vote on on that piece. I think it should just be something that we, um, and certainly not tonight. Um, I just think that's something that we should be we should be offering now and, and into the future, regardless. I just I just wonder about that a little bit. Um, because, you know, if in October, by October, I think, I assume that teachers might not know all of the kids, but might have a sense of, of, of who isn't engaged, who really needs help. And, and I wonder if we could save some out of school time by, by, by just having those, those teachers reach out to that handful of students at that time. Now this year was different because you know we had those assessments and we got to learn about the results of those assessments, which I found very extremely helpful. But um, assuming that we're back to normal uh, in the fall, God willing, um, I just wonder a little bit about that. And I'm, it's not, it's not a suggestion. It's not really even a question. It's just I'm putting that out into the, into the universe. Sure. And then I. Go ahead, that, go ahead, please. No, nope. I was just going to say that. So, if had we left the conferences where they were this year for next year's calendar, they would have been the 11th and 12th. So, essentially, you're getting them 10 days later, right? You're getting them. We moved them from the beginning of one week to the end of the next week. Yeah, and I and I have zero issue with that. Um, I'm going to respect the will of the the calendar committee on that piece. And um, uh, at a at a at a minimum, I think later is better than earlier. From where I sit, I'm a little. I'm um, of two minds uh, about how we structure it. Um, I would love to get those days back uh, for some other, um, for equity reasons. Um, I don't think, I don't think I have to mention again how much this, uh, this particular instructional tool, um, it, how important it is uh, to me personally and how, and what message it sends to our community. And so um, my last few little comments are going to be about that. Um, We've made great strides in, in equity um, as this instructional tool uh, and the message it sends to our diverse community um, in the last couple of years. And I'm really grateful for that. Um, there is more work to be done, and I'm very, very grateful for the Priority 1A and 2A calendars. Um, I want to put out into the universe that in order to achieve that equity that I think I'm looking for, um, I don't think that uh, includes a professional day. I think if we're truly going to be equitable and that no one is lesser than others, um, it, it must be a, a, a day closed uh, for students and staff um, because all means all. Um, I'm going to probably have some suggestions later in January just to tighten up a little bit of some of the language, but I'm truly grateful for the work that the calendar committees put into this. Um, and uh, and I, I love the new format. And um, I'm also 100% um, uh, with you on, uh, on spring break and always have been. Um, I've always found it odd that we don't have that true mental health break. And, 
and, and also because of the length of time we've been out in brick and mortar buildings, assuming that um, that that metrics are good, and I'm going to hold on to hope that they will be. Um, the sooner we can get our students back in a brick and mortar, the better. And so I'm also a, a pre Labor Day person, and unapologetically so. Thank you so much for all of your hard work, uh, and uh, and it doesn't go unnoticed for me, as you as you are well aware. <laughs> so thank you. Thank you, Ms. Answine. Can you hear me? Yes. Great. I want to start by thanking you all, and especially you, Mr. Moser. You seem to be able to do it all. So thank you very much. Uh, despite everything that's going on, you all have not presented just one uh, calendar, but you've presented two. Thank you. Um, Mike, I don't have too many questions, but I did have a question about... Um, you said that that you added a, a a day of learning at the end of one of the calendars, and I didn't quite understand why. You extended so, the day uh, for teachers as well as for students. So those are the two calendars uh, with A's, 1A and 2A. And so that was to incorporate Eid al Fitter as a professional development day. So it's a, it doesn't count as a school day for students. Uh -huh. Right, so you have to add a school day to the end of the year. Right. But if you don't want teachers and students ending their year on the same day, which is problematic, you then you have to move teachers to the next day, right? So to do that, then teachers are over their contracted number of days. So you have to subtract a work day, and that's where the work day that that's where one of the PD days from August gets cut off to compensate for that. So. Uh, so understood. Um, so the plan is to make it a professional work day and not a, a closed day in, the, in the, May. The motion that was the direction to the calendar committee under the February 2020 motion approved by the board was to include Eid Al Fitter as a professional development day. Okay. Well, that's all I have. Thank you very much. Sure thing. Mr. Lott. Um, Mr. Moser, if I just may, as a point of information uh, for the board's benefit and the public's, um, when we when this becomes an action item prior to that, there may be legal questions that the board may want to hear of information more relevant to some of the questions that you have asked Miss Antoine and Ms. Schalheim alluded to. And so that would be the, our future president could add that into the closed session agenda. And I would suggest that that would probably be appropriate um, for us to do so. Thank you. You may proceed, Mr. Mosier. Mr. Live. Thank you. Uh, I, I, have, I have no questions, Mr. Mosier. Just would you please extend my uh, personal thank you for the hard work of the calendar committee. I know this is a struggle every year and it's been that way. But uh, they did a fine job, and uh, they should be proud of their work. So thank you. I will certainly do that. Ms. Corkadell. I'll just say thank you um, to everyone in the calendar committee. I know that's a lot of hard work and heavy lifting, and under COVID, even more so, um, because there is so much uncertainty um, that we still have yet to face. So thank you, guys, each and every single one. And I know our students are up, uh, are taking their evening, in particular, um, extra shout outs to them for being willing to take this time. I have no questions. Um, the presentation was very thorough and thank you very much, Mr. Moser, for that. Um, <clears throat> what I'll do at this time, um, my new platform does make it a little more challenging for me to see hands up or reactions that um, you could use in lieu, the little clap reaction, for example. Um, so uh, just really quickly, if uh, there are any further questions or comments from board members, raise your hand or unmute. I'm not seeing any. Thank you guys so very much. Just as a reminder, once again, um, on January 4th, uh, the board, uh, is expected to be considering this as an action item um, to adopt. Thank you guys so very much. Um, mm -hmm. 
Uh, next item is 5.01, the monthly financial status report and fiscal year 2021 revenue and expenditure projections. And so um, joining us um, for questions is going to be Mr. Alex Chiknovich and Matt Stansky. Dr. Arlotto, if you wouldn't mind introducing um, for questions. Yes, ma'am. Thank you very much. You have the monthly financial status report before you. And as, and as uh, President Corkadel shared, Mr. Stansky and Mr. Shaknovich have joined us if there are questions of the board. Okay. Um, I'll open up to questions. We usually don't have um, a whole lot. Um, the information presented is usually self-explaining. Any board questions, please unmute at this time. Seeing no one mutes, um, we're gonna continue to proceed. And the next item is 5.02, the 2020 and 2021 reopening plan update. Dr. Alato. Yes, Madam President, thank you so much. And thank you members of the board. Um, as I've been able to do, and you've given me a chance each of the last several board meetings is to just give you some brief updates uh, regarding our planning for reopening. Um, so I'm, I have a couple of uh, uh, points that I'm going to make, um, updates in some of the areas that you've heard before. And then uh, I'm going to share a screen with you and share uh, two graphics that we have produced um, that will go live on our website this week that I wanna share with the board regarding um, re our, our roadmap to reopening and putting some information data out uh, regarding um, our reopening up to this point for the public. So let me begin by just a couple of updates and remarks regarding technology. As you know, that has been a heavy lift, uh, but a fabulous lift by our technology division. We have distributed over 55,000 Chromebooks thus far. We have ordered since March, 57,978 Chromebooks. We've received almost 24,000 of those and we're waiting for just about 34,000. Um, we just received 5,000 in the past two weeks and they're getting imaged and pushed out to schools as needed. So we'll continue to wait um, uh, for the remaining deliveries of those Chromebooks. Likewise, Chromebooks for students, we need to make sure that in this virtual environment, we're, we've got laptops for teachers and staff. We have distributed over 7,000 laptops to teachers and staff thus far. We've ordered 5,898 laptops beyond what we had already owned and began to distribute. We've received uh, 3,000 of those, so we're waiting on another 2,890 eight of those laptops and they are coming in in fits and starts, but they are continuing to arrive. Uh, we also uh, updated some desktops throughout a number of our schools. Uh, almost 7,000 um, uh, were uh, ordered and they've all been received and installed in the schools. And then finally, regarding technology, as I've shared in the past, Wi-Fi hotspots for Wi-Fi access for families and students. We have ordered uh, 423 and received all of those and they are distributed as needed. Our attendance, now that we have concluded the first marking period, um, we've been able to take a look at our attendance numbers for uh, the entire marking period. Um, overall, uh, we are just about, we're at 93.9%, .9%, so almost 94% attendance across the school system. The elementary attendance is 95.4%. Um, the middle school attendance uh, is at 94.2%. And the high school attendance uh, average um, uh, is at 91%. Um, an interesting point to note <clears throat> and update is there are just a total of six students that have not logged on to a device for a class um, throughout the entire district during this first marking period. Just six, three were elementary school students, one middle school student and one high school student. 
Um, now, certainly, if you, as the attendance numbers share, not every student is logging in every day, or we'd have 100% attendance across the board. But to have just six students um, that have not logged in at all over the course of the first parking period um, is to be commended. And I know the schools have worked really hard in reaching out to the families um, and our, and our um, internet access team headed by um, Ms. Carol Ann McCurdy um, uh, with a number of social workers and PPWs and some substitutes have worked really hard to connect families to internet access. We are continuing to focus, of course, on the online instruction and making that the best possible. Um, we are also, as that's, in, that's included in our online instruction, um, in our focusing on social emotional supports and interactions for our students continues to be important, as well as focusing on staff and student wellness, um, finding ways to connect communities to things like online yoga. Um, you know that our Healthy Meals program continues to flourish um, uh, and there have been some schools that have done virtual concerts and guest speakers um, uh, to involve the school community. And of course, what's important for us with our staff is professional development as we're all learning in this new environment. The development team has just done a phenomenal job, and I'll talk a little bit more about that in a minute. Lastly, um, uh, as you know, because of the current circumstance we're in with spikes in case rates um, and positivity rates around the county. We have temporarily suspended all of our small group programming. Um, but what has continued is that some of our special needs students that are enrolled in non-public schools in the states, in, in the state, um, some of those non-publics have closed down temporarily, likewise as we have and other school systems around the state. Some, however, have continued to operate. And so for a number of those students, we are continuing to provide transportation to those um, remaining open non-publics. Um, that's been a struggle at times in um, securing drivers and assistants to be available to take students uh, to those non-publics in this current environment. Um, but they have worked with us and have done a fabulous job. So we continue to be in touch with and in contact with um, our non-public school partners um, and closely monitoring their operational status, whether they're gonna be open or closed um, and communicating with families and making adjustments to transportation as necessary. So with that, um, uh, Mr. Mosher is gonna share uh, his screen. I wanted, as I said from the outset, I wanted to share um, some graphics um, that you'll be able to see. Um, and so, as you know, that um, uh, we have used this theme about a roadmap to reopening. Um, it was the focus and theme of our recovery, rigor, and readiness reopening plan that was submitted to Maryland State Department of Education and uh, was approved. So we intend at the end of each marking period to do an update in some of the key areas that were part of our um, opening the opening plan and as you can see here the graphic itself um, uh, uh, mirrors the graphics of our um, reopening plan but more importantly you see some of the data that I just shared with you whether it's technology um, uh, attendance you saw also the, the homework help and tutoring um, so a number of the key components of rigor recovery and readiness, we'll update at the end of each marking period and in this graphic format, post this to our website and this will be available um, at our website, uh, on our website beginning tomorrow. Um, we also highlighted this time, not only those three areas, but in particular, the readiness area. And so this second graphic that uh, Mr. Mosier is scrolling through um, focuses on one of those three components that are important to us in readiness as we continue to plan for the reopening of schools. Um, of course, our meals program is highlighted. Uh, the PPE that has been purchased and distributed to schools accessible for our staffs um, is highlighted. Uh, professional development to make sure that our staff is ready um, not only for continued in the virtual environment, but getting ready for the hot delivery of instruction in the hybrid environment. 
And you can see in a little bit further down the number, the phenomenal number of hours and the number of courses that our professional development office has put together and that our incredible teachers and staff have taken advantage of because they really do want to do the absolute very best for our students. Uh, they really are fabulous. And so um, we'll update this information at the end of each marking period um, as we are sharing uh, information and data with the public, certainly this board and the public overall, as it relates directly to our uh, reopening plan, um, which again, we, we uh, entitle recovery, rigor and readiness. And so with that, uh, uh, Madam President, I'm glad to take questions if there are any from the board. And I will begin in, uh, with your uh, uh, approval, Ms. Corkdale, I'll begin in roll call order. Yes, ma'am. Absolutely, so sir. I'll begin with Thank Mr. You Gilliland. Uh, thank you, Dr. Arlotto and uh, Mr. Mosier. Thank you for the wonderful scrolling. Um, <laughs> I, um, I just have one question. This might be a curveball, Dr. Arlotto, so not, not to put you on the, the spot with um, uh, statistics. You mentioned six students out of you know, 84,000, roughly 84,000 students who have not connected this, this school year. Do you know in a normal, what I'll call normal school year in, in, in prior years, perhaps is a better way of saying it. Um, we never have 100% attendance, but, but do you know roughly how many students are not uh, able to attend school? Yeah, I, I know the PPWs go, go and, and, and try to, to get those students back in, but do you have a rough idea what that number might be? Yeah, so we, so we average, um, uh, you know, we hover around um, on any given day, a, a total across all grade levels, um, 92, 93% attendance, um, sometimes a little higher, sometimes a little lower. It's typically higher at the elementary levels, as you would expect, and sometimes a little lower at the high school levels. So, so on any given day, we have, um, you know, we have uh, a fair number of students that um, that don't come to school on that given day. Um, uh, so we have um, we have seen an uptick. I shouldn't say an uptick. We've seen an increase um, uh, in attendance overall, um, and we think some of that is just due to access. Um, that it's not having to get on a bus, it's not having to get a ride to school, it's not having to walk. Um, uh, luckily, we've had really good weather overall in this fall. Um, uh, we typically see some, some attendance drop in the winter season. When it really gets cold or we've got snow or ice on the ground, we'll see our attendance begin to drop. Um, uh, so we are encouraged by overall by the attendance. Um, that students are logging on. Now they're not all logging on, as you saw from those attendance figures, every day, um, uh, because we still, you know, we're not 100% every day, um, but to have just six overall that have just not not connected com at all um, is, a, is a pretty phenomenal figure. I, I would just end, uh, you know, above all by saying thank you for the presentation, but kudos to your team and, and specifically, um, you know, the PPWs and, and the school-based staff who have really um, made that number as impressive as it is. I, I, I just think that's, that, that's stellar. Uh, for all intents and purposes. You would agree. And, and, and thank you for your thank you to the staff because it has just been, um, and it was that way in the term I used in March when we first went to closure and it stands true today is all, the terms I use are all hands on deck. And there are so many different offices that have lent assistance um, uh, uh, in, in reaching out to families um, and in looking to make sure that families are connected to the best uh, extent possible. Of course, connectivity is not 100% every day. That's the unfortunate part of technology, um, uh, but it really has been an all hands on deck and a phenomenal work. Um, and quite frankly, just our the, the, the fact that our um, uh, so much hard work on behalf of uh, that our parents have to um, to work so hard and set up the um, uh, makeshift classrooms, if you will, in in homes and environments that students are logging in and parents are overseeing that, and so they're true partners in this um, uh, in getting students logged in and connected to their classmates. Thank, thank you so much for this, and, and uh, thank you. 
all I have today. Thank you, Dr. Arlotto. Thank you, Madam President. This is Hummer. Unmute. Um, yes, the, I, just one question for you. This is, you know, I, I appreciate all the ongoing information of how prepared we are and how things are moving along. Um, I know because of the COVID numbers, we had to stop our small groups that were going very well, you know, in our special centers and the cat centers. Um, has the has the health officer, when our numbers get back to a to within the health metric ranges, are we going to be able to start those back up again? Once yes, we I've asked that. I've asked that very question, um, uh, Dr. Kalyan Raman and his team. As you know, we meet weekly. Uh, and I've asked that very question, and he is very supportive of us starting those small groups back up when the numbers come back down to an acceptable range. So he absolutely is. Um, um, uh, he has also um, uh, supported us in we are continuing to do some one-on-one -on -one assessment of students. So we've not closed that down completely. So some of our... Um, School psychologists are able to conduct some one-on-one -on -one assessments with students if their parents are able to bring them in to an assessment location, a school or an office. Um, so we are, we have gotten approval to continue to do that, um, but he has, yes ma'am, approved is, uh, and, and encourages us to get those small groups started back up. They'll be the first groups that, uh, that, that will be the first thing that we start back up as the numbers start to drop back down. Great. And I, I love hearing that about the one-on-one -on -one assessments because I know that you know, there, there was a little bit of a backlog when we came to assessing our students. Correct. Doing that, and so that we're able to continue that is it's huge. That'll be a great help. So thank you very much. Agreed. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Mr. Smith. Oh, I just want to say, um, woo -hoo, we did one quarter, you know, three more to go. <laughs> oh, my. I'm counting the days till graduation. It feels good. Um, the numbers look great. I'm glad we're really um, adjusting as we go. I just do have just one clarification question. Of the six students you mentioned that haven't connected at all, you said there were three elementary, one middle, and one high school student? Correct. That's only five. R right. I realize that. And I don't know where that fifth one is. Uh, it, it could be, uh, so I don't know where that fifth, I mean, where that sixth wow. student is. I don't know where they fall in, but you're absolutely right. I said six and I listed five. Okay. I was making sure I was there. So you're, you are on it, but I, I'm, I'm in search of where that last, where that sixth student is. So I made a note to myself and I'm going to, uh, I'm going to search that out. Fantastic. And with those uh, students that we do know of, um, I guess, what are the next steps for them? I guess we do know who the students are. Do we know necessarily why they're not showing up? Um, have PPW? I, 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 don't, I don't know specifically. Um, uh, the, um, uh, so there have been a number of people involved, as you've heard um, throughout this time, in uh, tracking students down, getting them connected, getting them online. Um, so I, I would assume that um, uh, that, yeah, there are, that we know, certainly I don't have the information, uh, but the staff at the school knows, um, as well as the local PPW, you know, the PPW that serves that school um, and is working with that family to find out you know, what it is or why it is they haven't logged on. Um, it could be that they're just a complete no-show. It could be a student that just is on our books and is just not attending, you know, clearly has not attended at all this year. Um, and may not even be living in the state anymore. I just don't know. Okay, well, thank you for that. And um, then about specific numbers, I know the teachers have to finalize grades by tomorrow, right? That's what I've been told. So do you know when we'll um, have the honor roll numbers for this quarter and if those can be made available? to the uh, They will. They, uh, we, always, we always make the honor roll numbers available. Absolutely. I don't know what the date is. I'll have to check with the data team to see when they'll have all that produced. Great. Because, you know, I would like that. Maybe, I guess, comparison to years past. I just want to see, you know, if students are still succeeding as they were in this virtual environment. But um, 
with that. I know that this first quarter it was probably filled with a lot of ups and downs, not just for students, but for teachers and staff too. And probably, you know, some people got to some pretty low moments, but you know, here we are and you know, only three quarters left. So I have a poem here. Um, my grandmother gave it to me and was on my wall for a number of years until I um, took it off because I think I put up a Orioles baseball poster, but um, I think it'd be fitting just to read it. So it goes, succeed in believing that you will not fail. With diligence and determination, your ship will sail. When the weather is stormy and the waters are rough, in the moment of peril, the strong get tough. Whenever life presses you down a bit, stand up and shout, I will not quit. And that's by Michael Wynn. I just think that um, if we just keep telling ourselves, don't quit, keep on pushing, we can make it, you know, we can really make it through any curveball that life throws at us. Well said, Mr. Smith, you're an inspiration, as is your grandmother. Mrs. Ellis. Thank you for the update. Um, um, only six students. I mean, obviously, we don't want one student untouched, but um, that's that's good news. Um, in a school system this size, and it's a testament to teamwork um, from you, Dr. Arlotto, all the way through every school building. Um, so I greatly appreciate um, the hard work everyone is doing um, in this crazy, unusual time. Um, so there's a whole lot of, there are a whole lot of plans still to be made, obviously, for getting our schools open, um, particularly if we have set the goal of opening all grades um, in some sort of way um, beginning next semester. Um, so as that work continues, Dr. Arlotto, um, I know the committees have representation from various stakeholders, um, including the teachers union and um, a few parents, but do you have plans to seek, I guess, additional guidance and, uh, or I guess input is a better word from um, more teachers at, at various grade levels, um, sort of for their classroom expertise, not, not as a representative of teachers or teachers union, but as, um, as, as experts in developing these plans and, and same with parents and students. Yes, ma'am. Okay. Um, and shoot, there was another, I had one more question. Um, and can you talk about the work the transportation department is doing at this point for um, getting these buses going? Um, we, you know, obviously they're not doing the same work um, that they would be doing if the buses were running right now. Um, so I don't know, can you just give us any, any insight onto what kind of work in progress has been um, achieved in transportation? Right, so, so no, I don't, I don't have any update on the, uh, on the transportation office, no. Okay. Um, all right, I'll offline try and get some more information, but thank you so much for your update. Sure. Mr. Granin. Uh, thank you, Dr. Ola. I'll just be brief and say, I know everybody's doing their best under bad circumstances and we all have you know, the best of intentions. Uh, I just share the views of the uh, those members of the public that uh, commented that uh, the sooner we get back to a place where families can choose, uh, you know, the better off uh, I think families will be. And with that, I have no questions. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Brandon. Uh, Ms. Schallheim. Yes. Uh, first, thank you for your update. As always, uh, I'm grateful for it. And... Um, 
the fabulous graphics that um, scrolled up the screen. Can you remind me, please, where those will be posted? Is it the, would it be aacps.org forward slash reopening plan? Is that the website where it's going to live? Or is there, I just want to know where to go because uh, it's my both eyes within the reopening up. plan. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. So, Michelle, you keep freezing, so I'm not. Oh, okay. Uh, I, I missed. I missed that question. You kept. You kept freezing up. Okay. Um. Am I? Are you? Am I with? Are you hearing me now? Yes, ma'am. Okay, great. So the graphics, the wonderful graphics that we all saw that we're scrolling, where where will those live exactly on the website? Our website's big. Is it the aacps.org forward slash reopening plan? Or is it the fall 2020 website? Just so I know where to go because my eyes couldn't keep up. And of course, I want to I want to read it more thoroughly. Of, of course. we Well, one, we'll, we'll send those to the board um, we'll have them posted on your site, so you'll have those separately. Uh, exactly. But my understanding is it will be both on the forward slash fall 2020 as well as the forward slash reopening. 2020, and then you'll be able to access those graphics from both those locations, I believe. Fantastic. Um, I wanted to ask about attendance. Um, these numbers seem wonderful, especially the the six students. Other members have touched on that. I share their sentiments. Um, our staff is obviously incredible in engaging everyone, and uh, I'm just grateful for your, you and your team's uh, work on, on that always. Um, with the breakdown of attendance, the 93.9% overall, and then the various figures for the elementary, middle, and high school, how, how would those match up if we were in person in a brick and mortar um, is 91% about what we would see for high school? Is 95.4% about what we would see for elementary? Are they, is it, um, are those very comparable to normal times, in quotes? They, they are. They're, they're, they're pretty comparable, yes. Fantastic. I just, um, I didn't know what to compare it to, and so, um, so knowing that is helpful. Um, I want to ask about tutoring. Um, I've had parents and students alike both raving about our tutoring offerings, and I and I it was my understanding at least that the the funding for that was disappearing at the end of this calendar year. If I'm wrong, please correct me. But if I'm right, how are we going to fill that void after the first of the year? So so the funding is. Um, uh, going to disappear, but uh, in terms of where we're getting the funding now, but uh, we intend to continue that um, through uh, the end of the year. So we're um, digging into the seat cushions, if you will, um, uh, to uh, ensure that we can continue that tutoring. Um, we are also, um, and Mrs. Ellis mentioned this in her uh, a brief report about from the budget committee uh, in a comment she made that there, there are some LEAs that got some of that federal funding have not spent it all across the state. And so we have been given an opportunity to access, possibly access somebody else's money that is unspent so it doesn't go back to the federal government, right? So the governor wants the rest, wants to be assured that the state of Maryland is not giving any money back. And so if we're able to access any additional funds, we will utilize it to support that, uh, that program and tutoring. But we hope to continue the, our plan is to continue the tutoring um, uh, um, uh, through the end of the year. And we use some of our uh, Title IV funding to do that also. So Title IV, and is that the seat cushion that you were referring to, or are there other seat cushions? Yeah, yeah. And, and, and if we can take money from some other budgets to make that happen, if there are monies that are 
not spent as we move into the year and we can move it into that category or that, not that category, but into that program uh, to keep it going because we are finding some success um, with it. The, te- the students you see by the numbers are accessing it. Um, uh, I likewise met with, a, um, with some students and, and uh, Mr. Smith was part of that uh, meeting a week ago and, and a number of the students raved about access uh, to the tutoring. So we, we plan to continue that. Yeah, I've, I've heard the same. And, uh, and, um, and so I'm thrilled to hear that that's, um, that, that the plans are to continue that. Um, uh, I have questions about the reopening in terms of COVID testing. The more I think about this gigantic, you know, problem that we're in, um, the more I think about COVID tests as, as part of the solution, obviously alongside some sort of vaccine when it, if and when it becomes available and hopefully uh, compliance with our uh, county and our state um, executive orders to wear um, masks because they do work and they protect um, not just uh, those around us, but our, ourselves. And so I wondered if there's been any um, talk with, uh, Dr. Kaliana Raman about uh, frequent and ongoing and consistent testing of of teachers and staff and and students as a way to get everyone back or as, to get at least portions of all three levels back, if not everyone back, um, to to pull out um, or to be able to quarantine as quickly as possible those that are infected and to allow us to. Um, have in, in-person live instruction um, as much as possible. Has there been any conversations about that? Yes, ma'am. Any specifics you can share at this moment? Oh, I, I, I was, I'm sorry. I was just, just answering the question. Yeah. Uh, so there are no specifics um, because that's purely in the realm of the Department of Health. What we've talked about is um, uh, is possibly providing access. So they don't want to do testing on the inside of buildings. So if there's testing that's going to be done, it would need to be on the outside of buildings. I would imagine setting up some kind of tent and, uh, and allowing for some kind of testing. Um, and we have said, um, whatever you are capable of putting together and staffing, because that's not something we can do, obviously, right. um, uh, that we would absolutely support it. Um, uh, I don't believe they have the staff to set up excuse me in the beginning 80 testing sites for example at our 80 elementary schools i don't believe they have the staff for that um so i think there may be some thinking down the road about having um some mobile i'll I'll use the term they have and i'll use the term uh, just for explanation um and conversation sake mobile testing units again this is these are my terms not the department of health but that gives you a visual of possibly having some department of health teams that would travel to a number of different schools on a given day and do some testing of both students and staff in those buildings. That's sort of the kind of thing we've talked about, but we would absolutely support, just like we support um, doing flu uh, vaccinations and flu mist at our schools, we would absolutely support COVID testing at our schools. No question about it. Wonderful. I, 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 I want to, um, and I know you get it, um, and I, I'm, I'm sure most of the board gets it, um, but I, I just want to put it out there on the record that, that th- this, to me in my mind, and no, I'm not a doctor, and no, I'm not an infectious disease doctor, what, I don't even play one on TV, but um, testing has to be part of this solution going forward until everyone is uh, vaccinated until we have a vaccine that that works and is effective and is safe and all the all the rest of it yada 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 we have testing ongoing consistent testing has to be part of it I'm I, I'm delighted that we're um, as open as we possibly can be to the Department of Health coming in and doing this um, I just think it's imperative um, so so important I know that's not something we can mandate or dictate I just I hope they see the the logic and the wisdom of this um, I hope we we have they have the funding to to pull it off um, because what I know hindsight's twenty twenty but um, if we knew then what we know now um, would we have 
uh, uh, closed um, things in the same order that we did? Um, and uh, would our priorities be different? And I hope the answer is is, is yes. And um, you know, our 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 children have to have to be the priority, and it is the key to to fully reopening an economy, in my view. Um, I had another question. I'll get off of my soapbox for a second. I have another question. I wanted to ask um, before, I, and I know that you're working on a plan that encompasses all three levels um, to some degree for the second semester. Obviously, I'm well in support of that. And I assume we're going to be asking people once again to make a decision, hopefully commit to whether or not they will be needing transportation when that time comes. Is You're nodding yes. Okay. For all those out there, he's nodding yes. So um, that's a good, that's good. Right. And, I, and, and while I'm nodding, we have said that, I've said that on a number of occasions, that we will, will, will reintroduce a survey to parents going into the second semester. Even if we had instituted the hybrid plan, we had committed to that. Perfect. And I just, I think that's, that's important. I love the opt-in model, as I've stated before. I think that's a, a, w- a great way to do that, not just in this pandemic, but going forward. Um, so that we can use taxpayer money as efficiently as possible. I, I just think that it, it warranted, uh, it, it bared repeating. Um, I think that that's all I have. I'm, uh, you know, I, I appreciate um, your leadership uh, on going throughout this crisis and obviously your staff. And I know we haven't, we're still in it, so we can't reflect on it in, recognize all the hard work and the endless hours uh, of staff yet, but I just, I just want to express my gratitude um, to, to, your, to your team and uh, to the food and nutrition services folks um, as well in particular. Um, and uh, and I, none of it goes um, unnoticed. I, I see um, the I just see the hard work every day um, in my in my daughter's classes, and it's a reflection also not just of uh, the great team in the school where she um, attends, but also of your entire senior staff who um, have led the charge and put everything together. And so um, I'm continue to be grateful. Thank you. Thank you, Mrs. Antoine. Thank you, Dr. Alato, and thank you very much for this um, presentation. You know what my eyes could catch of it? I saw three million meals served. Was that correct? Yes, ma'am. We've over over three million meals served. Yes, ma'am. Since March. That is awesome, and I I wanna it, um, I I just don't know what to say, especially in District One, where many parts of District One um are considered food deserts. I thank you all so much for holding the line there and ensuring nutrition for our students and even their families. Thank you. Um, and, and going down to just a single uh, digit in attendance, that's incredible as well. Thank you all for your, your efforts there. Thank you for the continuous efforts and, and not giving up on our students, especially to ensure that they understand how important even in crisis education is. So thank you for that. Um, my only question would be back over to the technical side. Um, I was looking at some of the figures that you shared concerning the Chromebooks and some of the modifies hot in the uh, other hotspots. Hotspots get very expensive over time. Um, are we making efforts to reach out to some of the service providers to help with um, more outreach in terms of wireless services like Verizon, AT&T, who offer um, digital gap closing um, uh, programs to schools? And many of those programs are free of charge, of charge from what I understand. So are we engaging with them at all, to, and which would definitely help with some of the costs of what we're putting out here? Yes, ma'am. We're, we're engaging with them every day. 
um, uh, 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 Caroline McCurdy and her team, along with uh, the 21st Century Foundation, um, are doing uh, yeoman's work um, in not just the outreach to the, in, in identifying and reaching out to the family, the households in need of connectivity, but they have worked hand in glove with our local providers, uh, Broadstripe, uh, certainly Verizon has been wonderful, uh, uh, but hands down the Comcast team uh, has just gone above and beyond to work with our families in providing connectivity. It is, as you say, um, it is much more cost effective to wire a household um, than it is to provide the MiFi hotspot <clears throat> because we pay the monthly bill on that Wi-Fi hotspot um, and the Comcast um, uh, Internet Essentials program is $9.99 a month. And so for a number of these families that we've connected, we or the 21st Century Foundation are paying that monthly bill. And for the families wow. that we're distributing the MiFi hotspot, we or the 21st Century Foundation are paying that bill. We cannot afford to do that into perpetuity. Exactly. And so getting those... Um, going back to your point, which is a great one, Mrs. Antoine, uh, working with our, um, our internet connectivity partners, um, they have been wonderful, um, uh, uh, and they are working to get people connected as best they can in those areas that don't have direct connectivity. Uh, they really have done a phenomenal job, um, uh, uh, and we'll continue to work with them, uh, but it would be best if we could get all those Households connected. So we, um, there is a push across the state and in Anne Arundel County as well um, to ensure connectivity for every household. That's not going to happen overnight. That's that the work that we're doing and a Wi Fi hot or a Wi Fi hotspot is a short term solution. Getting everybody internet connectivity throughout the state and certainly in Anne Arundel County is a long term solution. And that work is underway with our county executive, our county government, and the state government. Thank you, uh, Dr. Alano. Thank you for that. That's good to know. Um, then with grades and, and the um, final grades coming out, I think Mr. Smith shared tomorrow, there will be some, some upset, perhaps because of the new environment, uh, the virtual learning environment has not uh, been as a success, uh, as successful of an environment as the traditional has been for some of our students. Are we looking um, to ways not, to, and, and I'm not one that bases anything when it comes to education on grades, but are we looking for ways to support students who would normally be performing a lot better uh, at this time of year, but because of technical difficulties, the anxiety that was pointed out earlier tonight, um, and a number of reasons they were unable to perform um, as well as they could have. Are, there, are, are, are we looking at ways to help ensure that that doesn't continue, where they will get more enrichment when it comes to education, as well as opportunities to improve um, improve in the virtual as we remain virtual. Yes, ma'am. Just like we would in brick and mortar. Um, if we were in, in brick and mortar schools, the same review of grades, the same analysis, we'll do an analysis at this level, at my level on grades. Each of the schools will do an analysis. Each of the grades or content areas within the schools will do a grade analysis. Um, uh, counselors will look carefully at grades as they always do. Uh, and look to provide supports for those students. Uh, there, there could be, as you said, any number of reasons why students might not be successful. It could be because they just, uh, it, it could be the virtual environment itself. It could be connectivity issues, or it could be purposeful. It could be, I'm just turning off the machine and I'm not going to engage. So mm -hmm. um, there are a variety of reasons, but just like we would be in brick and mortar, we have um, processes and procedures in place at the end of each marking period, we'll, we do an analysis of grades. Department heads do an analysis of their history department, social studies department, 
department, I mean, social studies, science, whatever it might be, uh, the curriculum coordinators here at the central office level do an analysis of grades to see and assessments to see if there are changes that need to be made within the curriculum. So uh, that's something that's, that's always in place and will continue even in the virtual environment. Um, and then my, my final question would be as far as uh, kind of piggybacking on what Ms. Hummer brought up was, and, and I was happy to hear about the one-on-one -on -one engagement, and, and I know that's a lot of effort from you all. Um, with these COVID numbers increasing and not decreasing, are we looking at an alternative plan for students who simply cannot, um, they may be homeless or in foster, foster care, they may be unable to engage virtually. Are we looking um, into something that may introduce an alternative, not a full on hybrid alternative for schools, but something that can accommodate um, every student's circumstance as we move forward in a virtual environment? Um, I, I don't believe that we can accommodate every single circumstance that is out there. Um, as you see by the numbers, we've had great success in getting students connected um, uh, or students that are on, on alternative attendance plans. Um, our um, foster students and uh, our, our foster youth, as you mentioned, and homeless students are are connected um, and they're engaging, um, and oh, so good. they're 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 uh, for the most part doing well. They've got lots of supports, um, uh, but I'm certain that there are circumstances um, that are difficult for families that we might not be able to um, uh, to completely solve. Understood. Well, Dr. Lyle, thank you for your leadership and thank you for this update. Yes, ma'am. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Lai. Uh, Dr. Arlotto, thank you. Uh, I appreciate your report. Thanks a lot. Uh, yes, sir. I have a few comments and, and, and any question. Great. Uh, I, I agree with Mr. Granite that, uh, you know, I will wholeheartedly welcome the opportunity to offer our parents and students the choice to again return to our classrooms. I know you also have that same desire and, and, and determination. So I'm looking forward to that in the new year. Uh, and I could not agree more with Ms. Schalheim that our government at, at basically all levels really missed the mark in what has been deemed essential. You know, hospitals, healthcare, senior care, public safety, public education, that's essential. Home improvement, casinos, and it goes on and on. That is not essential. And we have really missed the mark on this. Uh, and and it's just, I shake my head every day of how we've proceeded through this without deeming public education as, as perhaps right along with all those others, the most essential thing we do for the, for the health, safety, and well-being of our communities, our states, and our country. So it, that just makes my head spin. My question has to do with uh, data and data that's shared with us, with you, from the health department. Uh, and you correct me if I'm wrong, but I, I, I'm pretty certain that we have no data or evidence to date that shows that COVID has spread within our buildings from employee to employee in the place of work or from student to student in athletic competitions and, excuse me, we're not allowed to compete yet, in athletic practices at the high school level. Uh, as I understand it, all instances of that, which has led to, you know, obviously, have been due to community spread, not 
Anne Arundel County Public Schools buildings, property, functions, activity spread. Is that correct? That's correct. Okay. That is, That's you are you are absolutely correct. There's been no, um, uh, certainly no data to share with us that uh, there's been any kind of um, outbreak uh, as defined by the state and the county um, uh, or significant spread in, in schools among our staff or among our student athletes. I believe in, in most cases, I won't say all because I don't have the background, Mr. Leib, on the contact tracing of every single incident we've had and our incidents are climbing right now. We're having yeah. more positive reports of employees now than we ever have been. But to your point, we, um, I'm not, uh, I'm not familiar with any that have been associated within the work environment within the school. It's always been from the community, as you say, brought into the school. All right. Well, I thank you. I just wanted to make sure I understood that. Yes, sir. Uh, again, thanks. Thanks for uh, being out there and taking the brunt of this very difficult time on behalf of all of us. And, uh, <laughs> Thank you. Again, I really look forward to the opportunity for our children uh, to be welcomed back into our school buildings. Thank you, Dr. Olaf. Yes, sir. As, as do I. Thank you. Mrs. Corkadell. Hi. Thank you so very much. Um, I'm always encouraged by the progress of our numbers as it relates to our Chromebooks and our MiFi's um, and the 21st Century Foundation is just doing awesome work with that. I, I just, um, it crossed my mind that um, when Miss Antoine was asking some of those questions that um, something maybe that wasn't brought up that may be relevant to it is that um, the partnership uh, for youth, family and children um, that Dr. Brown runs is also working with, I believe, um, Director Jordan, Pam Jordan, with the county to make sure that as they are working in the at the community level from the county, that some of their access to the MIFIs and the similar are being coordinated to maximize our uh, families' access to this stuff. Correct. Uh, absolutely. And that's happening. So thank you, uh, Mrs. Corkell. It's happening on um, sort of several different fronts. You talk about Dr. Pam Brown and her work with the county. She is just phenomenal. Oh, um, she's, she's out, as you well know, yeah. out and about mm -hmm. seven days a week, um, identifying gaps in services, looking to fill those gaps. And she's been a wonderful partner to us. So, so certainly um, she and her team have been wonderful. Likewise, as you know, uh, the county executive and I uh, put together um, uh, what we call a family cooperative. And so it's a, it's a small group of his team um, headed, um, uh, uh, was headed by his chief of staff. I'm not sure who's heading it now, along with uh, two of our folks here um, uh, and uh, uh, Miss Lori Jones and, and, and Dr. Sean Ashworth. And they meet regularly to talk about the needs within the county and in particular our families, and then look for resources and ways to fill gaps if, there are, if they are there. And then lastly, I would share with you, and I think many of you know this already because you've heard Dr. Gillens talk about it and she truly is wonderful. Um, she um, uh, uh, and um, uh, uh, Mrs. Uh, Jackson, meet regularly with uh, community groups and community members um, to seek their input and um, uh, to see where there are gaps in services where we can help um, uh, assist those families. And so they might report to us, and you talked about Chromebooks, where they know of a family that needs of, is in need of a Chromebook or need of internet access uh, or need of meals, and then they let us know, and then we can work with them and work with those families. So several different instances that are ongoing and have been for months where we're working um, uh, hand in glove with uh, the county services and county government to uh, to assist our families and our students. Yeah, it, it, it's amazing the collaborative effort from sewing teams to, um, you know, calls for volunteers and everybody drops, drops what they're doing and lends a hand. It's absolutely amazing. 
I know that um, Skip Ald, uh, the CEO of, of our library system, his, him and his team have also stepped up too. And I think I'd be remiss in not, not bringing uh, them into the fold. Um, I just wanted to, um, when Ms. Schallheim had brought up testing, I wanted just for my own purposes and probably would help public as well, is my understanding was when um, Dr. Kalyana Raman visited us on October the 5th, one of the pieces of his presentation and then was also subsequently addressed was the testing of schools and I believe discussed the availability of testing and how the state is coordinating management of that with the health departments and the um, his advisement on testing at that time. Has that changed since we've last heard from that that you're aware of? Because I have not heard of any changes to his advisement, whether it's for private or, or for public schools in that regard, correct? I, 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 if I understand the question, I, th I believe you are correct. Um, he, he, he remains supportive um, uh, of testing and he would like to coordinate some testing with us at the schoolhouse level. Yeah, so th this is the um, same supply issues, so to speak, that we would run into as we do with our Chromebooks and stuff that there, there's gonna have to be a assessment to that effect, right? Uh, correct, yeah, that will have to be, that they will have to advise us. I mean, they'll, they really have to not advise, they have to tell us um, both in terms of their staff availability to do it, to do advice, they have to tell us um, both in terms of their staff availability to do it, to do tests mm -hmm. and the availability of the testing kits. Uh, that's not something that we as a school system, you as a board, I as a superintendent have any access to. So anybody wanting more information on that, that would be more of a county conversation, correct? Um, right. and, until and such at, time they come to us with the information. Right, and but we'll, and we'll continue to have that conversation with them and, and, and hope to stay in the know. Yes. Well, it sounds like, the, you know, when we get the next update from them on that, um, that would be uh, provided. Sounds good. Um, the, uh, as it relates to, um, the mill services around the holiday, could you go over? I cannot remember how we handle the holidays. Usually when we're off, the, the, the services are off, correct? Correct, when school, is, when school is closed, the meal service is closed. Yes, they'll well, follow the same calendar. I, I gotta tell you, I'm asking a somewhat rhetorical question for I knew the answer to it because I just wanted to take a minute to remind everybody at our food pantries, we have empty pallets down at St. James, down at Lothian, one of our you know, areas of greatest need in the county and so many other food pantries. And I would just encourage folks, this is an easy, simple family way of engaging and giving back to the community because we're going to have more need, I believe, than we have ever seen in decades. And so I hope everybody um, is just reminded of that. I know many of our board members actively work in these programs, um, myself included in a variety of ways um, and any way we can support that and our families through these really hard weeks ahead and months ahead, please. Um, I, I hope everybody will join us. And thank you so much, Dr. Alato, and please share um, my extensions of gratitude to our food service team. I, they just, they're beyond rock stars. They're, hey, le they're I, legends. You are, they are, you are at you 100% correct. Thank you. They are rock stars. Indeed. They have been out there and on the front line literally since the first day of closure. Yeah. They are phenomenal. And, and their spirits and their level of hope. And, you know, a lot of people look into the eyes of, those who are needed or in need or are at a vulnerable moment and see despair, but it's, it's folks like them and all of our front lines that see the hope that they can provide um, to carry them through and also share that hope to carry others through. And uh, that, that is 
that is truly the communication challenge is making sure that we always walk away from someone leaving hope. And um, so, and I know every single one of our team members do that each and every day. Thank you very much. Uh, no questions further. Wonderful, thank you all very much. Um, do we have any other follow-up questions uh, from members? Yes. Um, looks like we have one hand raised, um, Ms. Schalheim. Uh, no, we do have two. So it'll be uh, Mr. Smith and Ms. Schalheim to keep in roll call order. And then looks like then Ms. Antoine. So you guys can remute until it's your turn, Mr. Smith. I just had a um, quick question. I know Carroll County and Baltimore County, they're now having a COVID dashboard on the website where they keep track of COVID cases within their school system. Um, are we going to implement that here in Anne Arundel County? So that's a good question. We are talking about building a dashboard. Um, my concern, Mr. Smith, right now with that is the state, the Maryland Department of Health has produced a COVID dashboard that is directly associated with LEAs and schools. So as reports of positive cases in outbreaks are being reported at schools, that information goes, of course, goes from a local health department to the state health department, and they have um, their um, school COVID case dashboard. I'm not really sure exactly what they're calling it, but that went live last week. <coughs> excuse me, on the, the Department of Health website, and so they're updating that. I think once a week, every Wednesday. Um, and so my concern, one of the things that we're looking at is if we produce a dashboard, my concern would be having data that, that might not be in line with what the state is producing. And I don't want anybody to be confused. So we're, we're looking at a dashboard and possibly producing something like that. But the state now has a dashboard that went live last week that's reporting outbreak cases at schools by school name in uh, um, in each of the jurisdictions. Okay, and it breaks it down like a teacher versus student, um, other faculty? No, it does. I don't believe it does that. Okay, okay. Well, um, it's good to know. I must have missed that memo. Um, but to me, it just seems like, <laughs> you know, maybe we just transfer their data to our website. So or we are, we are, we're looking at, that's possibly where we'll just have a, an access button from our site that, that you can just sort of one click and go to their dashboard. Um, uh, um, I, I'm always, again, I'm always a little concerned about, you know, with, about putting out data that might not be directly in sync with somebody else's data. They have the most up-to-date data and they are the State Department of Health, so we would rely on them. But we are, uh, it's a great question. We are, we are uh, actively talking about what a dashboard would look like for us and, uh, and our ability to build one, or do we just connect directly to the state dashboard? Great. And do you plan on um, communicating with our counterparts in Baltimore County and Carroll County, or have you already done that in consideration? Well, yeah, those are ongoing conversations with the superintendents. I've looked at uh, Hartford County has one. Um, Carroll County, I've looked at theirs and talked to Dr. Lockhart, who is their superintendent, uh, Dr. Williams up in Baltimore County. Those are yeah, absolutely, those are ongoing conversations. Great. Fantastic. Thank you. Yes, sir. Mr. Shalheim, did you have a question? Yes, I had a, a couple little follow-ups. Um, regarding Wi-Fi connectivity, it's my understanding that there's at least one part of our county where it was a logistical impossibility or improbability of, of getting um, that community um, wired um, ever. It, is that still the case or has the county um, acknowledged that specific um, neighborhood and is working towards a solution for that I, I it was my understanding that it was it was very specific um and so when we talk about everyone getting connectivity this is piggybacking on what miss antoine was asking earlier um i'm just wondering if if, if that will include um the that that neighborhood or those neighborhoods um that to this point was uh 
it was pretty improbable that they would ever get wired. Um, so <clears throat> you had two questions there. One, uh, is there, are there some neighborhoods in the county uh, uh, that are physically cannot or are not wired now? The answer is yes. There are yes. two specific that we are aware of. Um, and the second part, your second question was, is the county doing anything about that? In short, uh, I'm using, I'm paraphrasing. Um, and uh, the question is, I don't know what the county is doing. We have talked directly with the service providers to see if they'll uh, hook these areas up. And the answer right now, for whatever reason, is no. We have also, um, uh, um, we have also um, attempted Wi-Fi hotspots in those two communities, but they're so far removed from any kind of cell tower um, that the Wi-Fi hotspot is, doesn't work um, because it, it has to connect to a cell service, has to connect to a cell tower. Um, so there are um, the students that live in those two communities. We transport to Southern Middle School every day. Right, um, and so going Forward, especially when we're talking about the potential of, you know, out, outside of the box thinking in terms of conferences or how we would handle snow days um, in a different way down the road, I, you know, we'd have to consider those, those specific um, uh, communities and, and their needs. I know we will. I just, you know, um, as an equity thing, I just want to make sure that... Um, we keep those folks in, in mind with our decision making. I'm I'm sure you you are. Um, um, yes, yes ma'am. I mean, I, I I'm not sure if I was I was clear. It is an equity issue. We are transporting those students to Southern Middle School every day so that they can access their instruction. Oh yes. Oh no. I know yes. that. And oh, I know oh, that. I thought I thought maybe you. No. Um, you know, no. We are we are concerned about those families and are transporting them. Every day. Those Absolutely. Students. I'm I'm thinking about this in terms of going forward with, you know, in previous conversations tonight about calendar and um, various ways to handle different days and snow days and, and what have you. Um, and, and would that still occur on those days? And with and, and just keeping that in mind, um, it wasn't a uh, it was just thinking about. Those specific, those specific groups and, and a movement forward. No, I know that you've been, um, it's been incredible what you all have done with those um, uh, communities and solving that problem. I'm just thinking uh, forward as a follow-up to Ms. Antoine's conversations with you about on this call um, with regard to Wi-Fi connectivity and the county. Um, my second little question was about, um, instructional time and flex time and, you know, um, going forward for the second semester, of course, not for this coming marking period, it's all part of the same semester, but for the next semester, um, are you and your team still um, considering and weighing um, any sort of changes to those, um, to those items and, uh, and, and scheduling of, of class time in general, especially at the secondary level. Yes. Those okay. are ongoing conversations. Yes. Good, good. I mean, I've heard about it, you know, more than once now, um, a time or two and, and, uh, and, and have some ideas, you know, um, and some thoughts around that. I, I, um, I think what we've come up with for this um, semester is fabulous. And I just look forward to, using that as a base and, and um, improving it where we can to, to meet those, to meet those needs. Um, and that's all I had. Thank you. Great. Thank you. I believe Ms. Antoine, you indicated you have another question. Yes, um, please. I just, I wanted to, I failed to ask about the screen time, what the current screen time is. Is it, di is it different at each of the, um, 
the secondary and elementary levels, or is it is it the same? And then finally, is that screen time state mandated, or is this something that we locally could um, moderate and modify? Um, so Ms. Antoine, we're not we're not measuring screen time. It's measured um, uh, via the state on between uh, synchronous learning and asynchronous learning. So is the student able to synchronously interact with their teacher um, versus doing work on um, uh, away from their teacher uh, in an asynchronous format? So it's not we're not. Uh, so I'm not able to answer specifically how much screen time a student or teacher is accessing. It's synchronous for as versus asynchronous. So to answer the second part of your question, the state has mandated a minimum of three and a half hours of synchronous learning per day, um, uh, averaged across the week. So, uh, so it could be... Um, we can count the instructional time that a student say at the high school level is in their physics class, as well as the flex time that the student goes back and synchronously works with their teacher on some additional help. Those would count towards what I guess, they would count towards what I think you would be calling screen time, but they count towards the synchronous time that students can be engaged with their teacher. Okay, and so as a follow-up to that, are there talks or do you anticipate the state uh, possibly moving from the 180-day learning requirement with more engagement at the virtual level as it is as it's becoming um, to, to shorten the school year? Is that uh, a possibility? That has, that has not been discussed among the superintendents or the state superintendent to date. Okay, that, that's all I need uh, the answers to. Thank you very much, Dr. Lovato. Yes, ma'am. I think that does it um, for this item. Thank you so much, Dr. Lovato, greatly appreciated. Um, next item um, is item 6.01, administrative personnel appointments. Dr. Alato, do we have any this evening? No, ma'am, we do not. Thank you very much. Yes, ma'am. Item 6.02 is Mead Heights um, Elementary School Edition, the design development phase. And joining us uh, for questions uh, with the board is going to be Ms. Lisa Seaman Crawford and Kyle Roof. Dr. Alato, um, if you would, please. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I recommend board approval of the Mead Heights Elementary School Kindergarten Edition Design Development. So moved. Second. Motion and second has been made. At this time, we'll open up the floor to questions of staff and or comments to the motion. Um, Mr. Gilland, anything? No questions or comments, thanks. Ms. Hummer? No questions or comments. Mr. Smith? No questions or comments. Ms. Ellis? Mr. Grannon? Uh, nothing at this time, thank you. Ms. Shawheim? Nothing other, other than to say thank you. I, I enjoy reading these as always, thanks. <laughs> Ms. Antoine? Uh, excellent work as usual. Thank you very much. Mr. Ludd? Ditto. Absolutely. As always, greatly appreciated. You guys um, do excellent work both before the build as well as during and thereafter. Thank you guys so very much. Um, seeing no more uh, movement of the board, Ms. Howe, please call roll. Mr. Gilliland? Mr. Gilliland, you're muted. Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. 
Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Grannon? Aye. Ms. Schalheim? Aye. Ms. Antwine? Aye. Mr. Lyde? Aye. And Ms. Corkado? Aye. Motion passes 9 0. Thank you very much. Item 6.03, negotiated agreement between the Board of Education and the Teachers Association of Anne Arundel County. And joining us um, this evening, um, we have a couple folks. So um, including um, Ms. Melissa Rawls and uh, Mr. Uh, Russell Leone of president of the Teachers Association. Um, thank you all for joining us, Dr. Alato. Um, Please. Thank you, Madam President. Uh, I believe that um, uh, Ms. Rawls uh, has got some uh, opening comments regarding the um, work that's been done collaboratively with TAC. Um, uh, and I think Mr. Leone also has some comments um, uh, as he represents um, his with the Teachers Association. Yes, hi, good evening, Ms. Corkadell, Dr. Olato, and members of the board. The negotiating teams for the Board of Education and the Teachers Association of Anne Arundel County um, have reached a tentative agreement for fiscal year 2021, subject to your approval. In brief, the summary of changes as agreed upon by both parties include, but are not limited to, a, a mid-year step to all eligible Unit 1 employees, a mid-year back step to eligible Unit 1 employees who meet the established criteria, modifications to existing provisional salary scales, modification to um, job protection alternative leave uh, requirements, and finally modifications to Unit 1 resignation requirements. The negotiating teams diligently worked to reach an agreement that served the best interest of Anne Arundel County Public Schools, TAC members, and also support our ongoing commitment to AACPS students, staff, and community. I would like to thank Keith Wright, the chief negotiator for fiscal year 2021, Russell Leone, president of TAC, um, for their dedicated efforts during FY 2021 negotiations. On November 14th, 2020, TAC ratified this agreement and I respectfully request your approval and ratification of the noted summary of changes. Thank you. Good evening, President Corkadell, uh, Vice President Ellis, Dr. Arlotto and members of the board. Um, First, if I may take a moment during this American Education Week, I just wanna acknowledge and thank all of the de dedicated educators who work with our students from those in the birth to five program on up to our 12th graders. I hope we'll all take a moment to show our appreciation to the custodians, the teaching assistants, the related service providers, teachers, and everyone who plays a role in our children's education. Um, we truly have amazing people out there. So tonight, you're considering the tentative agreement between AACPS and TAC. And we're glad that we've been able to come to an agreement with all of the challenges that the recent events have presented. The members of TAC did vote to ratify this contract, but I must make it known that, the, that it wasn't a slam dunk vote. Um, I, nor do we really believe that this contract is what we were working towards and making really good progress on prior to COVID-19. But of course, the world had different plans for us. Um, the week before COVID, we had a consensus with AACPS to really address the root causes of some of the pay gaps that we've, we've experienced. And I know we've widely discussed those pay gaps in the past, and, but even under these difficult um, economic downturn that we've experienced, I do believe we're making progress forward. But it also must be known that the inequities that we've experienced in the past are not going away. So it is my hope that we will continue to support our veteran teachers to help repair some of those gaps as we move forward in our work together. And I hope that we can all commit to fix what was previously agreed that is needed to be addressed as we continue to work forward. So I appreciate uh, the work and acknowledge Ms. Uh, Rawls and her um, efforts leading the AACPS team. Thank you. 
So, Madam President, with that, I recommend approval of the tentative agreement between the Board of Education and the Teachers Association of Anne Arundel County. And again, thank Ms. Rawls and Mr. Leone for all their hard work on this very important issue. So moved. So moved. Second. Second. <laughs> Jinx. Oh, mercy. <laughs> we have a motion and a second. Um, okay. Um, not seeing any um, comments uh, from members. Uh, Ms. Howe, please call roll. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Ms. Hummer? Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Grannon? Aye. Ms. Schalheim? Aye. Ms. Antoine? Aye. Mr. Leib? Aye. And Ms. Corkado? Aye. Motion passes 9 0. Thank you very much, Ms. Howe. Greatly appreciated. Um, next item are consent items. Item, item 7.01, banking services 7.02, cabling, and 7.03, repair and painting of the sport courts and parking lots. Madam President, I move to bundle. Second. Motion to bundle and says, May, do we have consensus? Any dissent, please speak now. By consent, uh, the items have been bundled. Dr. Alato. Yes, ma'am. Thank you so much. <clears throat> I recommend that the Board of Education authorize the award of the contracts as listed on tonight's agenda, 7.01, 7.02, and 7.03. So moved. Second. Motion and second has been made. Um, available this evening uh, to answer any board questions is Mr. Alex Siknovich. Thank you so much, very much. Do we have any questions or comments of members? Please unmute. Seeing no movement of the board, Ms. Howell, please call roll. Ms. Corkadell, Ms. Corkadell, I don't know if yes. you saw me or not, but I did unmute. Oh, okay, no, I didn't. <laughs> Absolutely, go right ahead, Ms. Antoine. I did, uh, Mr. Siknovich. Uh, thank you all again for, for the work that continuously is happening, uh, especially in terms of our contracts and, and supporting the economy in these contracts. The question I had concerned the, uh, the last one with the repairs of the court and the, the den. Is, uh, is this contract in response to the recent vandalism or is this a standard contract, of, uh, standard support contract? Uh, Alex Shackman, the Chief Operating Officer. Uh, this is an open-ended requirements contract. Uh, we are piggybacking and partnering with the county government to receive the best prices. Uh, but again, it's a uh, it's a uh, piecework contract that we can selectively choose uh, whichever elements are required uh, as they as they uh, apply to either. Uh, painting lines in, in, on tennis courts or painting lines on basketball courts or painting lines on parking lots, et cetera. So uh, we do assessments of those uh, and then we repair and repaint those as necessary. But it is, okay. it is not in response to a specific incident. We do this each and every year and you'll notice uh, that it, uh, it is for a, a one, essentially a one year base with three one year renewal options so we'll have the opportunity to use this uh, for the next three uh, years in partnership with the county government. Yes, sir. Thank you very much. Thank you. Um, seeing no further questions of the board, Ms. Howell, please call roll. Mr. Gilliland? Aye. Ms. Hummer? This is it. Aye. Mr. Smith? Aye. Ms. Ellis? Aye. Mr. Grannon? Aye. Ms. Schalheim? Aye. Ms. Stantwine? Aye. Mr. Leib? Aye. And Ms. Corkadel? Aye. Motion passes 9-0. Thank you very much, Ms. Howe. A uh, couple announcements. Um, the next general board meeting will be this uh, on Wednesday, December the 2nd. 
And this will also be the meeting where we will be uh, seeing a farewell to our uh, to several of our members. So please um, join us at the beginning, at the very least, if you can. Um, and also, our policy committee will be meeting again on uh, December the 16th, and as well as the budget committee. And uh, the uh, also the uh, start time and transportation uh, related workshop will be occurring on December the 14th. Um, I hope everyone has a very safe and blessed Thanksgiving holiday and, um, and everybody stays well and healthy and um, travel smart. So with that in mind, I can entertain a motion to close. So moved. So moved, second. Consensus? We have consensus. This meeting is officially concluded. Good night.